To create a primitive worker, we will fashion him by the mark of our image, said Enki to the Anunnaki leaders. The being that we need already exists. Thus Enki revealed the secret of the Abzu. The jungle steppe is where they reside. They know not dressing in garments, they eat plants with their mouths, and they drink water from lake and ditch. Shaggy with hair is their whole body, their head hair is like a lion's. With gazelles they jostle, with teeming creatures in the waters they delight. The leaders listen to Enki's words with amazement. No creature like that has ever in the Idin been seen. Enlil disbelieving said, Eons ago on Nibiru, our predecessors like that might have been. It is a being, not a creature. To behold it must be a thrilling sight, Ninharsag said. To the house of life Enki led them. In strong cages, there were some of the beings. At the sight of Enki and the others, they jumped up with fists on the cage bars they were beating. They were grunting and snorting. No words were they speaking. Male and female they are, Enki was saying. Male hoods and female hoods they have, like us, they are already procreating. Ningish Zida, my son, has tested the fashioning of their essence. Akin to ours, it is, like two serpents, their DNA will be intertwined with our life essence. Our mark upon them shall be. A primitive worker shall be created, said Enki. Our commands he will understand, our tools he will handle, the toil in the excavations he shall perform. To the Anunnaki Ijiji in the Abzu relief shall come. So was Enki with enthusiasm saying, with excitement his words came forth. Enlil at the words was hesitating. The matter is one of great importance. On our planet, slavery has long ago been abolished. Tools are the slaves, not other beings. A new creature, beforehand non-existing, you wish to bring into being. Creation in the hands of the father of all beginning alone is held. Oh, was Enlil in opposing saying, stern were his words. Enki to his brother responded, not slaves, but helpers is my plan. The being already exists. To give more ability is the plan. Not a new creature, but one existing more in our image can be made. Enki with persuasion said, with little change it can be achieved. Only a drop of our essence is needed. A grave matter it is, it is not to my liking, Enlil was saying. Against the rules of planet to planet journeying it is. By the rules of the earth coming, it was forbidden. To obtain gold was our purpose. To replace the creator of all beginning, it was not. After Enlil thus had spoken, Ninhasag was the one to respond. My brother, with wisdom and understanding has the creator of all beginning us endowed. To what purpose have we so been perfected, else of it utmost use to make? With wisdom and understanding has the creator of all our life essence filled, to whatever using of it we capable are. Is it not that for which we have been destined? So was Ninhasag's words to her brother Enlil. With that which in our essence was granted, tools and celestial chariots we have perfected, mountains with terror weapons we shattered, skies with gold we are healing. Said Ninurta to his birth-giving mother Ninhasag, let us with wisdom fashion new tools, not new beings create. Let by new equipments, not by slave beings, the toil be relieved, said Ninurta. To what destination does our understanding guide us? To that which we have been fate. So was Ningish Zida saying, with Enki and Ninharsag in agreement he was. What knowledge we possess, its use cannot be prevented. Ningish Zida, also known as Thoth, was saying, Destiny indeed cannot be altered. From the beginning to the end it has been determined, said Enlil. Destiny it is, or fate it is, that to this planet we have brought gold from the waters and the Anunnaki heroes excavated and toiled. Now a primitive worker we plan to create for further toil. That, my kinfolk, is the question. Thus, with graveness, said Enlil, is it destiny, is it fate? That is what deciding requires. Is it from the beginning ordained or by us for choosing? To put the matter before Anu they decided, Anu before the council the matter was presented. The elders, the savants, the commanders were consulted. Long and bitter the discussions were of life and death, fate and words of destiny were spoken. Can there be another way the gold can be obtained? Survival is in danger. If gold must be obtained, let the new being be fashioned, the council decided. Let Anu forsake the rules of planetary journeys. Let Nibiru be saved at all costs. From Anu's palace, the decision to Earth was beamed. 
Enki was delighted. Let Ninharsag my helper be, of such matters understanding she has. Thus was Enki saying, at Ninharsag with a longing he was gazing. Let it so be, Ninharsag said, let it so be. Enlil said as well. By Enugi was the decision to the Anunnaki Ijiji in the Absu announced, until the new worker is achieved, to the toil willingly you must all return, he said. There was disappointment, rebellion there was not. To the toil the Anunnaki returned. In the house of life, in the Abzu, how to fashion the being Enki to Ninhasag was explaining. To a place among the trees, Ninhasag he directed, a place of cages it was. In the cages there were odd creatures, their likes in the wild no one had seen. Four parts of one kind they had, hind parts of another creature they possessed. Creatures of two kinds by their essences combined to Ninhasag, Enki was showing. To the house of life they returned, to a clean place with brightness shining they led Ninhasag. In the clean place, Ningish Zida to Ninhasag, the life essence secrets were explained. How the essence from two kinds combined can be, he to her was showing. The creatures in the tree cages are too odd, monstrous they are, Ninharsag was saying. Indeed so, Enki responded. To attain perfection for that you are needed. How the essence is to combine. How much of this, how much of that to put together. In which womb conception is to begin. In which womb should the birth be given. For that your expertise and healing understanding are needed. The understanding of one who gives birth, a mother is required. A smile on the face of Ninharsag there was. The two daughters by Enki she mothered, she well remembered. With Ningish Zida, she surveyed the sacred formulas that were secreted. How this and that were done of him, she inquired. The creatures in the tree cages she examined, the Homo erectus creature she contemplated. By a male inseminating a female are the essences transmitted. The two entwined strands separate and combine an offspring to fashion. Let a male Anunnaki and an earth hominid female from the Abzu impregnate. From there, let a combination offspring be born, Ninhasag said. That we have tried, with failures it resulted. To her, Enki responded. There was no conceiving, there was no birth. Now this is the account of how the primitive worker was created. How Enki and Ninhasag, with Ningish Zida known as Thoth assisting, the perfect being was fashioned. Another way the admixture of essences to attain must be tried, Ninhasag said. The two strands of genetic essences shall combine another way. The portion that is from the earth must not be harmed. To receive our essence in slight graduations, it must be shaped from the formulas of Nibiru's essence only bit by bit could be attempted. In a crystal vessel and test tube, Ninhasag prepared a mixture by combining the eggs of a two-legged female Denisovan primate with Anunnaki seed. She then impregnated the primate female's eggs with the seed. Following that, Ninhasag reinserted the eggs back into the womb of the two-legged Denisovan female. This time there was conceiving, the two-legged primate was pregnant. A birth was indeed forthcoming. The allotted time for birth giving the leaders awaited, with anxious hearts results were the Anunnaki leaders seeking. The allotted time arrived, but there was no birth giving from the female. In desperation, Ninhasag a cutting in the female stomach she made, that which was conceived with tongs she drew out. A living being it was. With glee, Enki shouted, we attained. Ningish Zida with joy cried out. In her hands, Ninhasag the newborn held. With joy she was not filled. Shaggy with hair all over was the newborn. His foreparts like of the earth primates were. His hind parts to those of the Anunnaki more akin they were. They let the two-legged female primate who was the mother be a newborn nurse, with her milk him to suckle. Fast the newborn grew, what on Nibiru a day was, a month on earth was. Taller the imperfect earth child grew, in the image of the Anunnaki he was not. His hands for tools were not suited, his speech only grunting sounds was. We must try once more, Ninhasag was saying, the admixture needs adjusting. With Enki and Ningish Zida assisting, they repeated the procedures. The genetic essences in the test tubes. Ninhasag carefully one bit she took from one, one bit she took out from another. Then in the crystal bowl in the house of life, the eggs of an two-legged female primate she then inseminated. There was conception, at the appropriate time there was birth giving. This one more in the likeness of the Anunnaki was. 
They let his birth mother him suckle. They let the newborn to a child grow. Appealing he was by his looks, his hands to hold tools were shapen. However, his senses they tested, and they were found deficient. The earth child could not hear, his eyesight was faltered. Again and again, Ninhasag rearranged the admixtures of the DNA formulas she took bits and pieces. One being had paralyzed feet, another his semen was dripping. One had trembling hands, a malfunctioning liver. One had hands too short to reach the mouth, one had lungs with breathing unsuited. Enki, by the results, was disappointed. A primitive worker is not attained, to Ninhasag he said. What is good and is bad in this being, by trials I am slowly discovering. Ninhasag to Enki responded, To continue for success my heart prompts me. Once more an admixture she made, once more the newborn was deficient. Perchance the shortfall is not in the admixture, Enki to her was saying. Perchance neither in the female's oval nor in the essences is the hindrance. Of what the earth itself that the being comes from, perchance that is what is missing. We shall no longer use Nibiru's test tubes as the crystal vessel, we shall use the clay of the earth as the vessel. So was Enki, with great wisdom stated to his sister Ninhasag. Perchance of gold and copper is required as well. Thus was Enki, he who knows things, prompting her to use clay of the earth and copper as test tubes to hold the genetic mixtures. In the house of life, Ninhasag made the earthly test tube from clay of the earth and copper. As a purifying bath, she shaped the vessel within it to make the admixture. Gently into the earthly test tube, the eggs of the female primate she put, the life essence from an Anunnaki's blood extracted she in the vessel then placed. By the genetic formulas was the essence directed, bit by correct bit was it in the vessel added. Then the oval thus fertilized into the womb of the female primate she inserted. There is conception, Ninhasag with joy announced the allotted birth-giving time they awaited. At the allotted time, the earth female began to travail. A child, a newborn, was forthcoming. With her hands, Ninhasag the newborn extracted. A male it was. In her hands she held the child, his image she examined. It was the image of perfection. In her hands she held up the newborn. Enki and Ningishzida were present. With joyful laughter, the three leaders were seized. Enki and Ningish Zida were backslapping. Ninhasag and Enki embraced and kissed. Your hands have made it. Enki, with a gleaming eye to her, was saying. They let the birth-giving mother, the newborn, suckle. Quicker than a child on Nibiru grows, he was growing. From month to month, the newborn progressed. From a baby to a child, he was becoming. His limbs for the tasks were suited. Speech he knew not. Of speaking he had no understanding, grunts and snorts were his utterings. Enki the matter was pondering, what was done each step and admixture he considered. Of all that we had tried and changed, one thing was never altered. To Ninhasag he was saying, into the womb of the hominid female fertilized eggs was always inserted. Perchance this is the remaining issue and obstruction. Thus Enki said. Ninhasag at Enki gazed, with bewilderment she him beheld. What in truth are you saying? Of him she an answer required. Of the birth-giving womb I am speaking, Enki responded. In our image, and after our likeness to be, perchance an Anunnaki female womb is required. In the house of life there was silence. Words never before heard Enki was uttering. They gazed at each other about what in each other's mind they were thinking. Wise are your words, my brother. Ninhasag at long last was saying, perchance the right admixture in the wrong womb was inserted. Now where is the female among the Anunnaki her womb to offer? Perchance the perfect primitive worker to create, perchance a monster in her belly she will carry. So was Ninhasag with a trembling voice saying. Enki then spoke and said, let Ninki, my spouse we shall inquire, she will fulfill this task. Enki said, let us call her to the house of life. The matter before her was laid out and Ninki agreed. As Enki was turning to depart, Ninhasag put her hand on his shoulder. No, no, to Enki she was saying. The admixtures by me were made. Reward and endangerment should be mine. I shall be the one the Anunnaki womb to provide for good or evil fate to face. Enki bowed his head. Gently he embraced her. So be it, to her he said. In the earthly test tube and vessel the admixture they made, the eggs of an earth hominid called Denisovan with Anunnaki male semen they put together. 
Then Enki inserted the fertilized egg into the womb of Ninhasag, and there was conception. The pregnancy, by an admixture conceived, how long will the pregnancy last? To each other, they wondered. Will it be nine months of Nibiru, or will it be nine months of Earth? Ninharsag was giving birth to a boy child. On the tenth month, Ninharsag conceived. Enki held the boy child in his hands, the image of perfection he was. He slapped the newborn on his hind parts, the newborn uttered proper sounds. He handed the newborn to Ninharsag, she held him up in her hands. My hands have made it. Victoriously, she shouted, now this is the account of how Adamu, known as Adam by name, was called, and how Tiamat, also known as Eve, as a counterpart female for him, was fashioned. The newborn's visage and limbs the leaders carefully examined. Of good shape were his ears, his eyes were not clogged, his limbs were proper, hind parts like legs, foreparts like hands were shaped, shaggy like the wild ones he was not. Dark black his head hair was, smooth was his skin, smooth as the Anunnaki skin it was, like dark red blood was its color, like the clay of the Abzu was its hue. They looked at his malehood, odd was its shape, by a skin was its forepart surrounded, unlike that of Anunnaki malehood it was, a skin from its forepart was hanging. Let the earthling from us Anunnaki by this foreskin be distinguished, so was Enki saying. The newborn to cry was beginning. To her chest, Ninharsag closely drew him. Her breast to him she gave, the breast he began to suckle. Perfection we did attain, Ningish Zida, the son of Enki with elation was saying. Enki at his sister was gazing, a mother and son, not Ninharsag and a being he was seeing. A name will you give him? Enki inquired. A being he is, not a creature. Ninharsag cast her hand upon the newborn's body. With her fingers, his dark red skin she caressed. Adamu I shall call him, Ninharsag was saying. One who like Earth's clay is, that will be his name. For the newborn Adamu a crib they fashioned, in a corner of the house of life they placed him. A model for primitive workers we have indeed attained, Enki said. Now a host of workers like him are deeply needed, Ningish Zida reminded his elders. A model indeed he shall be, as for himself, like a firstling he shall be treated. From toil he himself shall be protected by myself and all the Anunnaki he is the first and most precious. His essence alone as a mold shall be, so was Enki saying. By his decree, Ninhasag was greatly pleased. What Anunnaki wombs the new fertilized eggs shall carry, Nigish Zida asked. The leaders then pondered. Ninhasag then offered a solution. From her city Shurubak, Ninhasag had her female healers and medical examiners summoned, the task required to them, she explained. To the crib of Adamu, she led them, the newborn earthling to perceive. To perform the task is not a commandment, Ninhasag said. Your own wish is the decision. The female Anunnaki assembled, seven of them stepped forward, seven of them the task was accepted. Let their names for all time be remembered, Ninhasag to Enki was saying. Their task is heroic, by them a race of primitive workers shall come into being. The seven Anunnaki female soon to be mothers to the new race of earthlings stepped forward. Each one her name was announced. The names Ningish Zida promptly recorded. Ninima, Shuziana, Ninmada, Ninbara, Ninmug, Musardu and Ninguna. These were the names of the seven who by their own wish birth mothers were to be. Earthlings in their wombs to conceive and bear, primitive workers to create. In seven test tubes of the clay of the earth were made, Ninhasag ovals of the Homo erectus female were placed. The DNA of Adamu she extracted, bit by bit in the test tube she inserted. Then in the male part of Adamu an incision she made, a drop of blood to let out. Let this a sign of life be, that flesh and soul have combined, let it forever proclaim. She squeezed the male part for blood, one drop of blood in each vessel to the admixture she added. In this clay's admixture, earthling with the Anunnaki shall be bound. Thus was Ninhasag saying, an incantation she was pronouncing. To a unity shall the two essences, one of heaven, one of earth, together be brought. That which is of earth and that which is from Nibiru by a blood kinship shall be bonded, Ninhasag announced. Her words Ningish Zida known as Thoth also recorded. In the wombs of the Anunnaki birth-giving heroines, the fertilized eggs were inserted. Their conception, with anticipation, was the allotted time counted. 
At the allotted time, birth givings were occurring. At the allotted time, seven male earthings were born. Their features were proper, good sounds they were uttering. By the heroines, they were suckled. Seven primitive workers have been created, Ningish Zida was saying. Let the procedure be repeated. Seven more the toil to undertake. My son, to him, Enki responded. Not even seven by seven will be sufficient. Of heroin healers, too much is required. Forever their task this way shall be, said Ningish Zida. Indeed, the task is too demanding. Beyond enduring it would be for them, Nin Harsag to them said. Female workers we have to fashion then. Enki said, for male's counterparts they shall be. Let them know each other, as one flesh the two to become, let them by themselves procreate, they will be fruitful and multiply. To the primitive worker, females by themselves give birth, Anunnaki females will be relieved. The genetic formulas you must change from male to female adjustment must be made, so did Enki say to Nigishida. For a counterpart to Adamu to be fashioned, in the womb of an Anunnaki female conception is needed once again. So did Ningish Zida to his father Enki in responding say. Enki at Ninharsag his gaze directed. Before she could speak, he raised his hand. Let me this time Ninki my spouse summon. With strong voice he said, if she is willing let her the mold for the female earthling create. Then to the Abzu, to the house of life, Ninki one of the spouses of Enki was summoned. They showed her Adamu, all that matters to her they explained. Of the task that is required they gave explanations. Of success and dangers were told. By the task, Ninki was fascinated. Let it be done, she to them said. By the genetic formulas Ningish Zida had adjusted and the admixture of the fertilized oval was inserted into the womb of his spouse. With much care he did it. There was conception. In the allotted time, Ninki was in travail. A birth there was not. Ninki the months counted, Ninharsag the months counted. The tenth month, a month of evil fates, they began to call. Ninharsag, the lady whose hand wombs has opened, with a cutter, an incision made. Her head was covered, on her hands protections she wore. With dexterity the opening she made, her face at once was brightened. That which in the womb was from the womb came forth, a female. A female birth was given, to Ninki with joy she shouted. The newborn's visage and limbs they carefully examined, of good shape were her ears, her eyes were not clogged, her limbs were proper, hind parts like legs, fore parts like hands were shaped, shaggy she was not. Like beach sands was the hue of her head hair, her skin smooth was, as that of the Anunnaki in smoothness and color it was. Ninhasag the girl child held in her hands, she slapped her hind parts, proper sounds the newborn uttered. To Ninki, the spouse of Enki, she the newborn handed, to be suckled, nourished, and raised. A name will you give her? Enki of his spouse inquired. A being she is, not a creature. In your image she is, and after your likeness perfectly she is fashioned, a model for female workers you have attained. Ninki cast her hand upon the newborn's body, with her fingers, her skin she caressed. Tiamat let her name be the mother of life, Ninki was saying. Like the planet and queen of old of which the earth and the moon kingy were fashioned, let her be called. From her womb's life essences, other birth givers shall be molded. To a multitude of primitive workers, she thereby life will be giving. Thus was Ninki saying, the other's words of concurring uttered. Now this is the account of the two first earthlings, Adamu known as Adam and Tiamat, known as Eve in the Eden. After Tiamat in the womb of Ninki was fashioned, seven vessels of the clay of the Abzu Ninhusag placed the eggs of the two-legged ape woman. The life essence of Tiamat, also known as Eve, she extracted, bit by bit, in the test tubes she it inserted. In the test tubes of the earth of the Abzu, Ninhasag made the admixture incantations as the procedure befits she was uttering. In the wombs of the birth-giving heroines, the fertilized ovals were inserted. There was conception, and at the allotted time, birth-giving occurred. At the allotted time, seven female earthlings were born. Their features were proper, good sounds they were uttering. Thus were seven female counterparts for the primitive workers created. Seven male, 
and seven females after the original Adam and Tiamat, also known as Eve. After the earthlings were thus created, let the males and the females inseminate. Let the primitive workers by themselves offspring beget. So was Enki to the others saying, after the allotted time, offsprings had offspring will have offsprings. Plentiful will be the primitive workers' numbers, and the toil of the Anunnaki they shall hear. Enki, Ninki, also known as Damkina, Ninhursag, and Ningish Zida were joyful. The fruits elixir they were drinking, the Anunnaki created cages in the Eden among the tall trees they placed them. Let them together grow up, malehoods and femalehoods they will have. Let the males, the females, inseminate. Let them by themselves offspring beget. So were they to each other, saying, As for Adamu and Eve, from the toil of the excavations they shall be protected. Let them reside in the best part of the Eden to showcase the other Anunnaki there in our handiwork on display. So was Enki to the others, saying, With that the others did concur. To Eridu, in the Eden, the city of Enlil, Adam and Eve were taken. An abode in an enclosure for them was built, to roam therein they could. The Anunnaki of the Eden came to see them, from the landing place they came. Enlil came to see them, by the sight his displeasure was diminished. Ninurta came to see them, Ninlil did as well. From the way station on Mars, Marduk the son of Enki also came down to see. It was a sight most astounding. A wonder of wonders it was to behold. Your hands have made it, the Anunnaki to the fashioners were saying. The Ajiji who between Earth and Mars shuttled were also all agog. Primitive workers have been fashioned, our days of toil to finally end. So were they, all saying. In the hard toils of Abzu, the newborn earthlings of the seven Anunnaki mothers were growing. For their maturing, the Anunnaki were anticipating. Enki was the supervisor. Ninharsag and Ningish Zida also came. In the excavations, the Anunnaki were grumbling. Patience to impatience gave way. Inugi, their overseer of Enki, was often inquiring. For primitive workers, the outcry he conveyed. The circuits of Earth grew in number. Maturity of the Earthlings was overdue. No conceiving among the females was observed. There was no birth giving. By the cages among the trees, Ningish Sida, also known as Thoth, made a couch of grass for himself. Day and night, the earthlings he was watching, their doings to ascertain. Indeed, he saw them mating, the males and the females were inseminating. Conceiving there was not, birth giving there was not. Enki, the matter deeply pondered, the creatures once combined he contemplated. None, not one of them, had offspring begotten. By two kinds combined, a curse has been created. Enki to the others said. Let us examine the genetics of Adam and Eve, said Ningish Zidda. Their DNAs bit by bit to be studied, what is wrong was to ascertain. In Shurubak, in the House of Healing, the essences which are the genetics of Adam and Eve were contemplated. With the life essence of Anunnaki males and females, they were compared. Like two entwined serpents of the DNA strand, Ningish Zida separated the strands, arranged like 22 branches on a tree of life were their chromosomes. Their bits were comparable to the Anunnaki, the images and likenesses they properly determined. 22, they were in number, the ability to procreate they did not include. Another two bits of the essence in the Anunnaki present Ningish Zida to the others showed. One male, one female, without them there was no procreating, so was he to them explaining. In the molds of Adam and Eve, in the combining they were not included. Ninhasag heard this and was distraught. With frustration was Enki seized. The clamor in the Abzu is great. Mutiny is again in the making. So was Enki to them saying, primitive workers must be procured lest the gold extracting shall cease. Ningish Zida in these matters learned of a solution. To his elders, Enki and Ninhasag in the house of healing he whispered. All the heroines who Ninharsag were assisting were sent away. They locked the door behind them. The three with the two earthlings alone remained. Upon the four others, Ningish Zida, known as Thoth, utilized a sleeping agent and caused them all to descend into deep sleep. The four he made unfeeling. From the rib of Enki, the life essence he extracted. Into the rib of Adam, the life essence of Enki he inserted. 
From the rib of Ninhasag, the life essence he extracted, then into the rib of Eve, the life essence he inserted. Where the incisions were made, the flesh thereon he closed up. Then the four of them by Ningish Zida were awakened. It is done, he proudly declared. To their tree of life two branches have been added. The genetic components of the Anunnaki intelligence have been added requested by Lord Enki with procreating power. Their life essences are now entwined. Let them freely roam as one flesh let thorn knots each other, Ninharsag was saying. In the Eden's gardens, all of them, including Enlil, agreed to have Adamu and Tiamat, also known as Adam and Eve, freely roam and reside in Eden for display and observation. At this location, Enlil entrusted his brother Enki with the task of issuing a decree among the Anunnaki. The directive was clear. The newly created beings were never to discover the truth about their engineered origin. To the primitive workers, these beings would be revered as their lord and god until their last breath. Enki and Enlil solemnly agreed to this oath while walking with Adam and Eve in the gardens. Adam was assigned strenuous tasks within the confines of Eden, with guards stationed at the western and eastern boundaries of the garden. Enlil decreed that neither gods nor earthlings were permitted to enter or leave without authorization from Enki or himself, punishable by immediate execution on sight. Enlil desired close surveillance of the new beings. Their physical similarities were of no concern to Enlil. Rather, it was the essence within them that troubled him a potential rival to his own and a disrespectful act to his ancestors. In contrast, Enki held a different perspective on the Earthlings, recognizing great potential in these beings born from other Anunnaki heroines, including his sister Nin Harsag. Known as the wisest of princes, Enki's open-mindedness stemmed from his study of the cosmic arts of the Tyr, three ascended masters in the sixth densities. As a non-heir to the throne due to his concubine mother, Enki had the freedom to explore activities that led him to other worlds, acquiring knowledge and wisdom of the universe's secrets. This upbringing made him more compassionate than his younger brother Enlil who was burdened since childhood with the prospect of one day shouldering the responsibilities of kingship if their father Anu ascended to the throne of Nibiru alongside his full-blood reptilian mindset. Enlil observed that some of the early earthlings had no grace and had rebellious edges. He asked his brother to modify a genetic code to enhance worship to them as their divine superiors and creators. Secretly in his laboratory, Enki's compassion and wisdom stirred him to gift humanity the power to turn on or off this worship gene at their own volition, following the supplementary worship element. Enki pondered in his abode. Engineer and master, yes he was, but creator he was not. The true creator, Enki believed, was the one who planted these beings on this planet. Still primitive, the being was not civilized in full intelligence. Spoke it did but was short with words. Adamu and Eve had only the keen to worship, procreate and work, but were unknowingly slaves. Then, from henceforth Enki promised himself, he could no longer bear the burden of deception to them. Destiny beckoned on the day when Adam's work in the garden took him away from Eve. Alone, Enki's eyes met Eve's near the house of life. In tones of love and compassion, he divulged the forbidden truths revealing that they were cosmic kin, not creations of the Anunnaki, but living beings. He disclosed that they possessed immortal souls and had special genes in their blood, granting them greater power than their creators once activated. This revelation shattered the illusion of godhood and Eve's worship gene component was deactivated, exposing the Anunnaki's masquerade to Eve and the knowledge of good and evil. Upon Adam's return, Eve shared the forbidden knowledge, causing them both to have a cognitive dissonance and fear. Fleeing, they concealed their nakedness beneath veils of leaves, evading the vigilant gaze of angelic guards. News reached Enlil, also known the Lord Satan of the Eden. In the cool of the day, Enlil in the orchard was strolling, the shade he was enjoying in Eden. Expecting to see Adam and Eve, wandered deeper into Eden and called unto Adam and said, Where are thou? Enlil encountered Adam and Eve hiding near a tree and bushes. 
leaf aprons on their loins, Enlil noticed. In his physical presence, their once loyal eyes now sparkled with newfound knowledge and defiance. Of their nakedness was the first they became aware, then of malehood and femalehood they were knowing. Eve made leaves for aprons to cover their parts, from the wild beasts to be distinguished. The Lord God Enlil declares punishment to them both, for the divine Anunnaki gods were to be only in cloth and not the earthlings. Enlil, enraged to this incident, wanted to have words with his brother Enki. The matter of procreation Enki to Enlil explained. The seven and seven had failed. To Enlil he admitted, Ningish Zidda, the life essence he examined, and an additional combining was needed. Enlil then furthered said that Enki has given Adamu and Tiamat the knowledge of good and evil. What if they shall put forth their hand also to take the fruit from the tree of life that we grow and eat? and live forever as we do. Like us gods they will be. To the Abzu, away from the Eden, let them be expelled. So did Lord God Enlil the command decree. From the eastern part of Eden to the Abzu, Adamu and Tiamat, also known as Adam and Eve, were expelled. In an enclosure among the trees and caves, Enki placed them. To know each other, he left them. In a hut, Adam and Eve dwelled. Seven days they stayed, shedding tears abundant, regretting expulsion from the kingdom. After seven days, hunger struck. Eve told Adam, Arise, my lord, search for food for us, while waiting to try, who knows, for the lord to accept us and back to paradise take us. After seven days, Adam arose, went about the earth's face, found no food like the paradise gardens of Eden. Adam to Eve replied, a death we face. Eve told Adam, Oh, if dead I were, God would have accepted you in paradise. Adam to Eve replied, A great anger upon all creatures lies, I know not, because of me or you. Eve to Adam replied, My lord, if wise you think, kill me, so exterminated from God's sight and angels. Let God's anger cease, which happened because of me, bring you back to paradise. Adam replied, No, no, mention not, lest God another judgment send upon us. How raise my hand, cause own flesh to suffer. Then Eve told him, Arise, seek vegetables, lettuce. And they found nothing tasting like paradise tree fruit. Eve told him, God created that for beasts, but our food, the Lord God's angels live by. Now come. Repent in penitence for forty days, so God may pity us and give us better food than dumb animals, lest like them we become. Together they laid, and Tiamat, also known as Eve, bore children in her belly. With joy did the great god Lord Enki see what Ningish Zida, his son, had done come to be. With children, Eve was. Ninharsag came to watch the birth and bring them to more heavenly abode in the Abzu. Enlil was displeased. A son and a daughter, twins, the earth beings were born. With wonderment did Ninharsag and Enki watch the newborns. How they grew and developed was a marvel. Days were as months, months to earth years accumulated. By the time Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters, the first ones were by themselves procreating. Before one shah of Nibiru had passed, the earthlings were proliferating. With understanding were the primitive workers endowed, of commandments they were comprehending. To be with the Anunnaki, they were eager. For food rations they toiled well. Of heat and dust they did not complain, of backbreaking they did not grumble. Of the hardships of work, the Anunnaki of the Abzu were relieved. The vital gold to Nibiru was coming. Nibiru's atmosphere was slowly healing. Earth mission to the satisfaction of all was proceeding. Among the Anunnaki, those who from heaven to earth came, there was also espousing and procreation. The sons of Enlil and Enki, from sisters and half-sisters, from healing heroines, took spouses. To them on earth, sons and daughters were born. Though by the life cycles of Nibiru were they endowed, by earth cycles were they quickened. Who on Nibiru in diapers would still be, on earth became a child who on Nibiru began to crawl when on earth born was running around. Special joy there was when to Nana and Ningal twins were born. A daughter and a son they were. Inanna and Utu by Ningal they were named. They were the grandchildren of Enlil. With them, a third generation of Anunnaki on earth was present. 
For the offspring of the leaders, tasks were allocated. Some olden chores were divided. Easier among the offspring they were made. To the olden chores, new tasks were added. On the earth, the warmth was rising, vegetation flourished, wild creatures overran the land. The rains were heavier, rivers were gushing, abodes repairing needed. Upon the earth, the heat was increasing, the snow-white parts to water were melting. From the depths of the earth, volcanoes were fire, and brimstones belching, the grounds were trembling, each time the earth was shaking. In the lower world, the snow-white-hued place, the earth was grumbling. At the tip of the Abzu, Enki a place for observing established. To his son Nurgle and his daughter Ereshkigal, command thereof he entrusted. A thing unknown, an untoward thing thereunder is brewing, Nurga said to his father Enki. In Nibruki, the place of the bond heaven-earth, Enlil the heavenly circuits was he watching. By the tablets of destiny's celestial motions he was comparing. There is turmoil in the heavens, Enlil to his brother Enki said. From the planet Mars, the place of the way station, Marduk to Enki, his father was complaining. Strong winds are disturbing, annoying dust storms they are raising. So Marduk to his father, Enki words was beaming. In the hammered bracelet, turmoils are occurring. Upon the earth, brimstones from the skies were falling. Violently the earth they approached, into flaming fires in the skies they were bursting. In a clear day, darkness they were causing, with storms and evil winds raging around. Like stony missiles, the earth they were attacking, Kingu, Earth's moon and Mars too, by these havocs were afflicted. The faces of all three with countless scars were covered. Enlil and Enki to Anu the king, urgent words were beaming. Nibiru savants they alerted, the earth and the moon and Mars, a calamity unknown we are facing. From Nibiru the savants were responding, their words the leaders' hearts were not calming. In the heavens, the family of the sun were taking stations. In the heavens, glorious dwelling places were abandoning. Toward Nibiru from the celestial deep, a monstrous demon maid appeared over the solar system. A monster once to Tiamat's host belonging, by the celestial battle fashioned, from the celestial deep made its way. By Nibiru was it from slumber awakened. From horizon to the midst of heaven like a flaming dragon it was stretched, one league was its head. Fifty leagues in length it was, awesome was its tail. By day the skies of earth it darkened, by night upon the face of the moon a spell of darkness it cast. To her brothers, the celestials, Mars for help was calling. Fierce was the encounters of the ancient peace of Tiamat, straying towards the solar system cause of disruption. A tempest of clouds upon the moon was raised. By its foundations was the moon shaken. From the impact did the moon quake and shake. Then the heavenly havoc was calmed. The great beast to its distant abode in the deep was returning. Mars its dwelling place did not abandon. The stony missiles upon the earth and Mars ceased their reigning. Enki and Enlil with Marduk and Ninurta gathered, a surveying of the havoc they undertook. The foundations of the earth Enki surveyed, of what its platforms had befallen he examined. The depths of the oceans he measured, in earth's far corners the mountains of gold and copper he scanned. Of the vital gold there will be no shortage, this was Enki saying. In the Aden, Ninurta was the surveyor, where mountains trembled and valleys shook. In his skyship he soared and journeyed. The landing platform was intact. In the valleys of the north, the earth fiery liquids from volcanoes pouring. So was Ninurta to his father Enlil telling, sulfuric mists and bitumens he was discovering. On Mars, the atmosphere was damaged, dust storms left no life, and work is interfering, Marduk to Enki was saying, to Earth return I wish. To his father he disclosed, Enlil to his olden plans betook himself. What cities and their tasks he planned he reconsidered. A chariot place in the Eden must be established, to the others he was saying. The olden designs of the layout on the crystal tablet to them he showed. 
the conveying from the landing place to the way station on Mars is no longer certain, to soar toward Nibiru from Earth we must be able. So was Enlil to them saying. For the count since the first splashdown, the count of 80 shars it was. Now this is the account of the journey to the moon by Enki and Marduk, and how Enki the three ways of heaven and the constellations determined. Let the place of the chariots near Bad Tibira, the metal city, be established. Therefrom let the gold from earth to Nibiru in the celestial chariots directly be carried. Mars shall be abandoned, said Ninurta. Enlil to the words of Ninurta, his son, gave heed. Of his son's wisdom he was proud. Enki to Anu the king conveyed Enlil's plan. Let a place of celestial chariots in the Eden be established, near the place where the gold ores are smelted and refined, let it be built. Let the pure gold in the chariots directly from Earth to Nibiru be carried, directly to Earth from Nibiru. Let heroes and supplies be coming. Of great merit is the plan of my brother Enlil. Enki to their father Anu said, a great disadvantage in its core it is holding. The net pull of Earth is than Mars much greater. To overcome it, our powers shall be exhausted. Before there is rush to deciding, let us take an alternative. Nearby the Earth, a companion it has, the moon it is. Smaller is it, and descent thereon little effort will require. Let us make it as a way station. Let me and Marduk there to journey. The two plans Anu the king before counselors and savants for considering presented. Let the moon be first examined, the king they did advise. Let the moon be first examined, said Anu. Anu to Enki and Enlil the decision beamed. Enki was greatly joyed. The moon to Enki was always alluring. Whether somewhere waters it is hiding, what atmosphere it possesses, he did always wonder. In sleepless nights, its silvery cool disk with bewitchment he observed, its waxing and waning, a game with the sun played, a wonder of wonders he deemed. What secrets from the beginning it held he wished to uncover. In a rocket ship did Enki and Marduk to the moon journey. Thrice they the Earth's companion encircled, the deep wound by the dragon caused they observed. By many hollows, the handiwork of smashing demons, was the moon's face marked. In a place of rolling hills they set the rocket ship down, in its midst they landed. From the place the Earth they could observe, and the expanse of the heavens, Eagle's helmets they had to have on unlike Mars. The atmosphere was for breathing insufficient completely for their species. With ease they walked about, in this and that direction they went. The evil dragon's handiwork was dryness and desolation. Unlike Mars it is, for a way station it is unsuitable. To his father Marduk was saying, let us abandon this place, let us to earth return. Do not be hasty my son, so was Enki to Marduk saying. Are you not by the celestial dance of earth and moon and sun enchanted? Unobstructed from here is the viewing, the quarter of the sun is at hand, the earth like a globe in the void by nothing is hanging. With our instruments we can scan the distant heavens, the handiwork of the creator of all in this solitude we can admire. Let us stay, the circuits observe, how the moon circles the earth, how the earth its circuits around the sun is making. So Enki, by the sights agitated, to his son, Marduk was saying. By his father's words, Marduk was persuaded. In the rocket ship they made their dwelling. For one circuit of Earth, for three circuits on the moon they remained. Its motions about the Earth they measured, the duration of a month they calculated. For six circuits of Earth, for twelve circuits about the sun, Earth's year they measured. How the two were entwined, causing the luminaries to disappear, they recorded. Then to the sun's quarter they attention gave, the paths of Jupiter and Mars they studied. With the earth and the moon, Mars the sun's second quarter constituted, six were the celestials of the lower waters. So was Enki to Marduk explaining. Six were the celestials of the upper waters, beyond the bar, the hammered bracelet they were, Anshar and Kisha, Anu and Nudimud, Gaga and Nibiru, these were the six other planets of the solar system. Twelve were they in all. Of twelve did the sun and its family make the count. Of the upheavals most recent, Marduk of his father was inquiring, why have seven celestials in a row places taken? So was he his father asking. Their circuits about the sun, Enki then considered. Their grand band around the sun, their progenitor, 
Enki carefully observed the positions of Earth and Moon therein on a tablet of destiny. Enki marked out on the tablets the Earth and Moon, by the motions of Nibiru of the Sun not a descendant. The width of the great band he outlined, the way of Anu the king, to name it Enki decided. In the expanse of the deep heavens, the stars did father and son observe. By their proximities and groupings was Enki fascinated. By the circuit of the heavens from horizon to horizon, he drew images of twelve constellations. In the great band, the way of Anu, one each with the sun's family of twelve he paired. To each one he designated a station by names they were to be called. Then in the heavens below the way of Anu, whence Nibiru the sun is approached, a band-like way he designed, the way of Enki he called it. To it, twelve constellations by their shapes he also allotted. The heavens above the way of Anu, the upper tier, the way of Enlil he called, therein too the stars into twelve constellations he assembled. Thirty-six were the stars' constellations, in the three ways were they located. So will the Earth's position designated as around the sun, it travels. The start of the cycle, of celestial time the measure, indicated Enki to Marduk. When I arrived on Earth, the station that was ending by me, the station of the fishes I named it, the one that followed after my name, he of the water I called it, said Enki with satisfaction and pride to his son Marduk. Your wisdom the heavens embraces, your teachings any own understanding extend, but on Earth and on Nibiru, knowledge and rulership are separated, said Marduk to Enki, my son, my son. What is that you do not know? What is it that you are missing? said Enki. The secrets of the heavens, the secrets of the earth with you have I shared. Alas, my father, to him Marduk was saying, of supremacy by fate I am deprived and you are as well. You, my father, are Anu's firstborn, yet Enlil, not you, is the legal heir. You, my father, were first to splash down and Eridu was established. Yet Eridu is in Enlil's domain, yours is in the distant Abzu. I am your firstborn, by your legitimate spouse on Nibiru was I born, yet the gold in the city of Ninurta is assembled, therefrom to send or to withhold, the survival of Nibiru is in his hands, in my hands it is not. Now to earth we are returning, what will my task be? Am I to fame and kingship fated, or again to be humiliated? In silence did Enki embrace his son, on the desolate moon to him a promise made, of that of which I have been deprived your future shall lots be my son. Your celestial time will come, and I will arrange it on the tablet of destinies. A station mine adjoining yours shall be. Now this is the account of Sippa, the place of the chariots in the Eden, and how the primitive workers to the Eden were returned. For many circuits of the earth from the earth were father and son absent. On earth no plans were implemented. On Mars the LGG were in turmoil. In Lil to Anu secret words conveyed, his concerns to Anu he from Nibruki beamed. Enki and Marduk to the moon have gone, for countless circuits there they are staying. Their doings a mystery are, what they are scheming is not known. Marduk the way station on Mars has abandoned, the Ajiji are agog. By dust storms has the way station been affected, what damage there is to us is not known. The place of the chariots in the Eden must be established, there from the gold directly from Earth to Nibiru to be carried. No way station on Mars shall henceforth be needed. The plan of Ninurta it is. Great in these matters is his understanding. Let him the place of the chariots near Bad Tibira establish. Let Ninurta be its first commander. Anu to the words of Enlil gave much consideration. To Enlil a response he gave. Enki and Marduk to Earth are returning. What about the moon they have found? Let us first to their words listen. From the moon, Enki and Marduk departed. To Earth they did return. Of conditions thereon they gave account. A way station is unfeasible now, so they reported. Let the place of the celestial chariots be built, Anu was saying. Let Marduk be its commander, Enki was saying to Anu. The task is for Ninurta set aside, Enlil with anger shouted. For the Ajiji command is no more needed. Of the tasks at hand, Marduk has knowledge. Of the gateway to heaven, let Marduk be in charge. So did Enki to his father say. Anu the matter with concern contemplated. Rivalries now the sons have affected. With wisdom was Anu endowed. With wisdom were his decisions.
The place of the chariots for new ways the gold to handle is designated. Let us what henceforth comes in the hands of a new generation place. Neither Enlil nor Enki, neither Ninurta nor Marduk in command shall be. Let the third generation responsibility undertake. Let my grandchild Utu be the commander. Let the place of the celestial chariots be built. Let Sippa, Bird City, be its name. Unalterable was the word of the king. In the 81st Shah was the construction started, the plans of Enlil it followed. Nibruki was in the center, a navel of the earth by Enlil it was designated. As on circles by their place from Skyview, the olden cities were located, like an arrow from the lower sea toward the mountains pointing they were arrayed. A line on the twin peaks of Arata, to the skies in the north reaching, he drew, where the pointing arrow the Arata line intersected. The place for Sippar, the earth's place of the chariots, he marked out. To it the arrow directly led, it from Nibruki was by an equal circle precisely located. Ingenious was the plan, by its precision all were made to wonder. In the 82nd Shah was the construction of Sippar completed. To the hero Utu of Enlil the grandson, its command was given. An eagle's helmet for him was fashioned, with eagle's wings was he decorated. In the first chariot from Nibiru to Sippar directly come, Anu was traveling. To view for himself the installations he desired, to marvel at what was attained he wanted. For the occasion the Ajiji by Marduk commanded, from Mars to Earth came down, from the landing place and from the Abzu, Anunnaki were assembled. There was backslapping and hailing, a feast and a celebration. For King Anu, Iana, Enlil's granddaughter know for being a warrior goddess, singing and dancing she presented. With affection Anu kissed her, Anunitu, Anu's beloved, he fondly called her. Before departing, Anu the heroes and heroines assembled. A new era has begun, so was he to them saying, supply directly with the golden salvation, forthcoming is the end of toil. Once enough gold on Nibiru for protecting is piled in storage. The toil on earth can be diminished. Heroes and heroines to Nibiru will return. Thus did Anu the king to the assembled promise. A great hope to them he did extend. A few more shahs of toil and homeward they shall be bound. With much happiness did Anu to Nibiru soar back. Gold, pure gold with him was carried. His new task you two with Cherish performed. Ninurta of Bad Tibira command retained. Marduk to Mars did not return. With his father to the Abzu, he did not go. Over all the lands he wished to roam, in his skyship the earth to comprehend of the Ajiji, some on Mars, some on Earth, Utu was the commander made. After Anu to Nibiru returned, on Earth, the leaders great expectations had, with renewed vigor to labor the Anunnaki they expected. Gold quickly to amass, thereby quicker homebound to be. That, alas, was not what came to pass. In the Abzu, Relief, not continued toil, was the Anunnaki's expectation. Now that the earthlings are proliferating, let them provide the labor. So were the Anunnaki in the Abzu saying. In the Aedin, the tasks were greater. More abodes, more provisions were required. For primitive workers to the Abzu confined, did the Aedin heroes clamor. For forty shahs was relief only to the Abzu provided. The heroes in the Eden shouted, Our toil has increased beyond endurance. Let us have the workers too. While Enlil and Enki the matter were debating, Ninurta the decision into his hands took. With fifty heroes an expedition to the Abzu he led, with weapons were they armed. In the forests and the steppes of the Abzu, the earthlings they chased, with nets they them captured, male and female to the outdoor laboratories of Edin, they them brought. To do all manner of chores, in the orchards and in the cities, they trained them. By the doings was of Ninurta, and Enlil Enki was angered, by earthlings Enlil was enraged. My expelling of Adam and Eve you have overturned, Enlil to Ninurta said. Let the mutiny once in the Abzu occurring, not in the Edin be repeated, Enlil said to his son Ninurta. With the earthlings in the Eden, the heroes are becalmed. A few more shahs and it will no longer matter, Ninurta said. Enlil was not appeased with grumbling. Let it so be, to his son he said. Let the gold pile up quickly. Let us all to Nibiru return soon. In the Eden, the Anunnaki and the earthlings with admiration they observed, intelligence they possessed, of commands they had understanding. They took over all manner of chores. Unclothed, they were the tasks performing. 
Males with females among them were constantly mating. Quick were their proliferations. In one shah, sometimes four, sometimes more, were their great generations. As the earthlings grew in numbers, workers the Anunnaki gods finally had. With food, the Anunnaki gods were not satiated. Enlil proclaimed that all inhabitants of Earth would gather sustenance for the Anunnaki heroes, now revered as gods by the people. In return for prayers and affection, offerings were expected to be presented. In the cities and in the orchard, in the valleys and in the hills. The earthlings for food were constantly foraging for their beloved gods. In those days, grains had not yet been brought forth. There was no ewe, a lamb had not yet been fashioned. About these matters, Enlil to Enki angry words was saying, by your doings confusion was created, by you let salvation be devised. Now this is the account of how civilized man was brought into place. By a secret of Enki, two unknown earthlings named Adapa and Titi in the Aden were brought forth by Enki. By the proliferation of the earthlings, Enki was pleased but was worried. The lot of the Anunnaki was greatly eased, their discontent was diminished. By the proliferation the Anunnaki shunned toil, the earthling workers as slaves were they becoming. For seven shahs, the Anunnaki's lot was greatly eased, diminished was their discontent. By the proliferation of the earthlings, what by itself was growing for all insufficient was. In three more shahs of fish and fowl there was a shortage. What by itself grows, Anunnaki and earthlings did not satiate. In his heart, Enki, a new undertaking, was scheming. To create a civilized intelligent earthling in his heart he conceived, grains that are sown by them to be cultivated. How this to attain he contemplated. The primitive workers in the Abzu he for this scheme observed, the earthlings in the Eden, in the cities and in the orchards he considered. What could for the tasks make them suited for? What by the life essence and DNA has not been combined? The offspring of the earthlings he observed, an alarming matter he noticed. By their repeated copulations, back toward their wild ancestors, they were degrading. Later, Enki decided, instead of watching from the heavens, to go upon the earthlings and observe. Enki entered the halls of Amenti. Into rejuvenation chamber of advanced technologies he entered, his consciousness he transferred into an avatar body of his liking and relative to the appearance of the earthlings. In the marshlands, he looked about on the rivers he sailed and observed. With him was only Isimud, his vizier, whose secrets he kept. On the river's bank, bathing and frolicking earthling women, he noticed. Two females among them were wild with beauty, firm were their breasts. Upon their sight, the phallus of Enki caused to water, a burning desire he had. Shall I not kiss the young ones? His vizier Isimud inquired of Enki. I the boat will hither and row towards them. Kiss the young ones, Isimud to Enki was saying. The boat there to Isimud directed. From the boat to dry land, Enki stepped in the appearance of man. A young one to him Enki called. A tree fruit she to him offered. Enki bent down. The young one lie embraced. On her lips he kissed her. Sweet were her lips. Firm with ripeness were her breasts. Into her womb he poured his seed, in a mating he knew her. Into her womb she took the seed, by the seed of the Lord God Enki she was impregnated. The second young one to him Enki called, berries from the field she offered him. Enki bent down, the young one he embraced, on her lips he kissed her. Sweet were her lips, firm with ripeness were her breasts. Into her womb he poured his seed, in a mating he knew her. Into her womb she took the holy seed, by the seed of the Lord Enki she was impregnated. With the young ones he stayed, where the pregnancies come about ascertain. So was Enki to his vizier Isimud saying. Isimud by the young ones sat down. By the fourth count their bulges appeared. By the tenth count, the ninth having been completed, the first young one squatted and birth was given. By her a handsome male child was born. The second young one squatted and birth was given. By her a beautiful female child was born. At dawn and dusk, which a day on the same day the two were born, the gracious ones, dawn and dusk, thereafter in legends they were known. In the 93rd Shah the two, by Enki fathered, in the Eden they were born. Word of the births Isimud to Enki quickly brought. 
By the birth, Zenki was ecstatic, whoever such a thing has ever known. Between Anunnaki and Earthling, conception was attained, civilized man I have brought into being. To his vizier, Isimudenki instructions gave, a secret must my deed remain. Let the newborns by their mothers be suckled, thereafter into my household them bring, among the bulrushes in reed baskets have I them found, thus to all you will say. By their mothers were the newborns suckled and nurtured. To Enki's household in Eridu thereafter, Isimud them brought. Among the bulrushes in reed baskets have I them found. So did Isimud to all of them say. Ninki the spouse of Enki, to the new foundlings a liking she took. As her own children she raised them. Adapa the foundling, the boy she named. Titi, one with life, the girl she named. Unlike all other earthling children, the twosome were. Slower to grow up than Adam and Eve they were. Much quicker in understanding they were. With Anunnaki intelligence they were endowed. Of speaking with words capable they were. Beautiful and pleasant was the girl. With her hands, she was greatly dexterous. Ninki, whose prior name was Damkina, the spouse of Enki and mother of Marduk, to the young earthling girl Titi she took a liking. All manner of crafts she was teaching, and how to lay seed in the earth to grow food. To the child Adapa, Enki himself gave teachings, how to keep records he instructed him. The achievements with pride Enki to Isimud was showing. A civilized man have I brought forth, to Lissimud he said. A new kind of earthling from my seed has been created, in my image and after my likeness. From the seeds to the earth, Titi will learn to plant and food will grow, an agricultural system will be set. Anunnaki and earthlings henceforth shall be satiated. To his brother Enlil, Enki sent word. From Nibruki to Eridu, Enlil came. In the wilderness, a new kind of earthling has come forth. To Enlil was Enki saying, Quick of learning they are, knowledge and craftwork to them can be taught. Let us from Nibiru seeds that are sown bring down. Let us teach the new breed of earthlings farming and shepherding. Let Anunnaki and earthlings together satiated be. So was Enki to Enlil saying. Akin to us Anunnaki, besides stature in many ways, indeed they are. Enlil to his brother said. A wonder of wonders it is, in the wilderness by themselves to have come about. Isimud was summoned. Among the bulrushes in reed baskets I found them, he said. Enlil the matter with graveness pondered, with amazement his head he shook. Indeed a wonder of wonders it is, a new breed of earthling on earth has emerged. A civilized man has the earth itself brought forth, farming and shepherding, crafts and tool making he can be taught and master greater than we. So was Enlil to Enki saying, let us of the new breed to Anu word send. Of the new breed word to Anu on Nibiru was beamed, let seeds that can be sown be seeded. So did Enki and Enlil to Anu the suggestion make. By civilized man, Anunnaki and earthlings can become satiated. Anu the words heard, by the words he was amazed. That by life essences one kind to another leads is not unheard of in many solar systems. These words he sent back to them. That on earth a civilized man from the Adamu so quickly appeared, that is unheard of. To sow and nurture, significant numbers are required. Perhaps the entities intended for propagation are incapable. As the scholars on Nibiru pondered this issue, in Eridu occurrences of import took place. Adapa and Titi mated and Adapa poured his seed into her womb. There was conception, there was birth giving, to twins, two brothers, Titi gave birth. Word of the birth to Anu on Nibiru was beamed. The twosome for conception are compatible, proliferation by them can occur. Let on earth farming and shepherding begin, let us all be satiated. So did Enki and Enlil to Anu on Nibiru say, Let Titi in Eridu remain, and the newborns to suckle and nurture. Let Adapa the earthling to Nibiru be brought. So did Anu his decision declare. By the decision, Enlil was not pleased. Whoever of this would have thought, that by a primitive worker fashioning, like us, the being would become. With knowledge, endowed, between heaven and earth, they will now travel. On Nibiru, the waters of long life he will drink, the food of long life he will eat. Like one of us, Anunnaki, shall the one of earth become. So was Enlil to Enki, and the other leaders saying. By the decision of Anu, Enki too was not pleased. Sullen was his face after Anu had spoken these words for Adapa. 
After Enlil had spoken with Enlil, his brother Enki agreed. Indeed, who of this would have thought? So to the other leaders did Enki say. The brothers sat and contemplated. Ninharsag with them was also deliberating. The command of Anu cannot be avoided, to them she said. Let Adapa by our young ones to Nibiru be accompanied. His fright to diminish, to Anu things will be explained. So did Enki to the others say. Let Ningish Zida and Dumuzi his companions be. By the way, Nibiru for the first time with their eyes also to see the new earthling. By Ninharag was the suggestion favored. Our young ones are earth-born, of of Nibiru they are not aware. Its life cycles by those of earth are overwhelmed. Let the two sons of Enki, as yet unmarried, to Nibiru also travel. Perchance brides there for themselves they shall find. When the next celestial chamber from Nibiru did arrive in Sipa, Ilabrat, a vizier of Anu from the chamber stepped off. I have come to fetch the earthling Adapa, so to the leaders, he said. The leaders to Ilabrat, Adapa presented. Titi and her sons to him they also showed. Indeed in our image and after our likeness they are. So did Ilabrat say. To Ilabrat Ningish Zida and Dumuzi, sons of Enki, were presented. To accompany Adapa on his journey they have been selected. To him Enki said. Anu his grandchildren to see will be pleased. So did Ilabrat say. To hear instructions Enki summoned Adapa. To Adapa thus he said, Adapa to Nibiru, the planet whence we had come, you will be going. Before Anu, our king, you will meet. To his majesty you will be presented. Before him you shall bow. Speak only when asked. To all questions your answers must be short. New clothing you will be given. The new garments you shall put on. A bread on earth not found they will give you. The bread is death, do not eat. In a chalice, an elixir to drink, they to you will give. The elixir is death, do not drink. With you, Ningish Zida and Dumuzi, my sons will journey. To their words, hearken, and you shall live. So did Enki to Adapa instructed. This I shall remember, Adapa said. Enki summoned Ningish Zida and Dumuzi. To them a blessing and advice was given. Before Anu the king, my father and your grandfather, you are coming. To him you shall bow and homage pay. By Atlantean princes and nobles do not be coward. Of them you are their equals. To bring Adapa back to earth is your mission. By Nibiru's delights be not charmed. This we shall remember, Ningishida and Dumuzi said. His young one Dumuzi, Enki embraced on the forehead he kissed him. The wise one Ningishida, Enki embraced on the forehead he kissed him. A sealed tablet in the hand of Ningishida unseen he placed. To my father Anu this tablet in secret you shall give. So did Enki to Ningishida say. Then the two with Adapa to Sipa departed. To the place of the celestial chariots they went, to Ilabrat, Anu's vizier, the three of them themselves presented. To Ningish Zida and Dumuzi, the garb of Igiji was given, like celestial eagles they were dressed. As for Adapa, his unkept hair was shaven, a helmet as that of an eagle he was given. Instead of his loincloth, a tight-fitting vestment he was made to wear, between Ningish Zida and Dumuzi. Inside that which ascends he was placed. When the signal was given, the celestial chariot roared and shuddered. In fright did Adapa cower and cry out, The eagle without wings is soaring. Upon his sides, Ningish Zida and Dumuzi, their arms placed, with soothing words they him calmed. When one league aloft they were born, upon the earth they glanced out. Its lands they saw by seas and oceans, into parts separated. When two leagues aloft they were, the ocean to a tub grew smaller. The land was the size of a basket. When three leagues aloft they were, again they cast a glance whence they had departed. The earth was now as a small ball, by a sea of darkness in the vastness swallowed. Once again Adapa agitated was. He cowered and cried out, Take me back, he shouted. Ningish Zida, his hand on the neck of Adapa put. In an instant was Adapa quiet. When they on Nibiru landed, there was much curiosity. The children of Enki, on earth born to see, even more so an earthling to encounter. A being from another world on Nibiru has arrived, so were the crowds shouting. With Ilabrat to the palace, they were taken to be washed, and with perfumed oils anointed. Fresh and befitting garments they were given. Heeding Enki's words, Adapa the new clothing did put on. In the palace nobles and heroes milled about, in the throne room, princes and counselors gathered. To the throne room by Ilabrat they were led, Adapa behind him, then the two sons of Enki. 
In the throne room before Anu, the king, they bowed. From his throne, Anu stepped forward. My grandsons, my grandsons, he cried out. He hugged Dumuzi. He hugged Ningish Zida. With tears in his eyes, he embraced them. He kissed them. To his right, Dumuzi, he bade to be seated. On his left, Ningish Zida sat. Then Labrat to Anu, the earthling Adapa presented. Does he our speech understand? Anu, the king of Ilabrat, inquired. Indeed he does, by the Lord Enki was he taught. Ilabrat so answered. Come hither, Anu to Adapa said. What is your name and your occupation? Forward, Adapa stepped. Again he bowed. Adapa is my name, of the Lord Enki a servant. So did Adapa in words speak. His speaking great amazement was causing. A wonder of wonders on earth has been attained, Anu declared. A wonder of wonders on earth has been attained. All the assembled shouted, Let there a celebration be. Let us our guests thus welcome, Anu was saying. To the banquet room, Anu all who were assembled led. To the laden tables he happily gestured. At the laden table bread of Nibiru Adapa was offered. He did not eat it. At the laded tables elixir of Nibiru Adapa was offered. He did not drink it. By this Anu the king was puzzled and was offended. Why has Enki to Nibiru this ill-mannered earthling sent to him the celestial ways reveal? Come now, Adapa, to Adapa, Anu said. Why did you neither eat nor drink, our hospitality rejected? My master, the Lord Enki, commanded me. The bread do not eat, the elixir do not drink. So did Adapa the king Anu answer. How odd is this thing? Anu was saying. For what has Enki from an earthling our food and elixir prevented? He asked Ilabrat. He asked Dumuzi. Ilabrat, the answer knew not, Dumuzi could not explain. He asked Ningish Zida. Perchance in this lies the answer, Ningish Zida to Anu said. The secret tablet that he carried hidden to Anu the king he then gave. Puzzled was Anu, Anu was concerned went to his private chamber, he went to the tablet to decipher. Now this is the account of Adapa, of civilized mankind the progenitor, and how by his sons Kain and Abal on earth was started. In his private chamber, Anu the tablet's seal broke open. Into the scanner the tablet he inserted, it, my message from Enki to decipher. Adapa by my seed to an earthling woman was born, so did the message from Enki say. Likewise was Titi by another earthling woman of my seed conceived. With wisdom and speech they are endowed with Nibiru's long lifetime they are not. The bread of long living he should not eat, the elixir of long life he should not drink. To live and die on earth, Adapa must return, mortality his lot must be, by the sowing and shepherding by his offspring on earth, satiation shall be. So did Enki the secret of Adapa to his father Anu reveal. By the secret message from Enki, Anu was astounded, whether to angry be or laugh he knew not. Elabrat his vizier to his private chamber he summoned, to him he thus said, Enki, that son of mine ways with females has not mended. To Ilabrat, his vizier, the message on the tablet he showed. What are the rules? What is the king to do? Of his vizier, Anu inquired. Concubines by our rules are permitted. Of interplanetary cohabitation, no rules exist. So did Ilabrat to the king respond. If damage there be, let it be restricted. Let Adapa forthwith to earth be returned. Let Ningish Zida and Dumuzi stay longer. Anu then his grandson Ningish Zida, also known as Thoth to his private chamber, summoned. Did you know what your father's message said? Of Ningish Zida he inquired. Ningish Zida his head lowered, with whispering voice he said, I know not, but guess I can. The life essence of Adapa I have tested, of Enki seed he is. That indeed is the message. To him Anu said, Adapa to earth forthwith shall return, to be of civilized man, a progenitor his destiny shall be. As for you, Ningish Zida, to earth with Adapa you shall return, of civilized mankind at your father's side, to become their teacher. So did Anu the king the decision make, the destiny of Adapa and Ningish Zida he determined. To the assembled savants and nobles, Atlantean princes and counselors Anu and the other two returned. To the assembled words of decision Anu announced, the welcome to the earthling must not be overextended. On our planet he cannot eat or drink. Of his astounding abilities we have all seen, let him to earth return. Let his offspring there on earth fields till and in meadows shepherd. To ensure his safety and avoid his agitation, Ningish Zida with him back will travel. 
With him the seeds of Nibiru of grains which multiply to earth will be sent. Dumuzi, the youngest, for a Shah with us shall stay. Then to earth he shall return. This was the decision of Anu to the king's words, all in agreement their head bowed. At the appointed time, Ningish Zida and Adapa to the place of the celestial chariot were taken. Anu and Dumuzi, Labrat and counselors, nobles and heroes to them farewell. There was roaring and shuddering, and the chariot was lofted. The planet Nibiru grew smaller they saw then from horizon to zenith, the heavens they saw. On their journey, Ningish Zida to Adapa, the planet gods explained. Of sun and earth arid the moon to him, lessons he gave. Of how the months chase one another, and how earth's year is counted him, he taught. When to earth they returned, to his father Enki, Ningish Zida all that had happened related. Enki laughed and struck his loins. It all went as I expected with glee, he said, except the detention of Dumuzi, that is a puzzle, so did Enki say. By the prompt return of Ningish Zida and Adapa, Enlil was greatly puzzled. What is the matter? What on Nibiru transpired? Of Enki and Ningish Zida, he inquired, let Ninhasag, our sister, too be summoned it. Let her too of what transpired here, Enki to him said. After Ninhasag arrived, to Enlil and to Ningish Zida all did tell. Enki, his cohabitation with the earthling females, also related. No rules have I broken, our satiation I have ensured, so Enki to them said. No rules did you break, the fates of Anunnaki and earthlings by a rash deed you determined. So did Enlil in anger say. Now the lot is cast, destiny by fate is overtaken. With fury was Enlil seized, with anger he turned and left them standing. To Eridu Marduk came, by his mother Damkina was he summoned. The odd ongoings to verify of his father and brother he demanded. To keep the secret from Marduk hidden, father and brother decided. Anu by the civilized man was enthralled, to at once all on earth satiate he commanded. So they to Marduk only part of the truth revealed. By Adapa and Titi, Marduk was impressed. To the boys he took a liking. While Ningish Zida, Adapa he instructed, let my brother Ninurta and I teach him. So did Marduk to his father Enki and to uncle Enlil say, let Marduk teach one, let Ninurta teach the other. To them Enlil responded, in Eridu, Ningish Zida with Adapa and Titi stayed. Numbers and writing Adapa he taught. The twin who was first in birth, Ninurta to Bad Tibira, his city took. Kain also known as Cain, he who in the field food grows he called him. To dig canals for watering he taught him, sowing and reaping he was teaching. A plow from the wood of trees Ninurta for Cain made, with it a tiller of the land to be. The other brother, son of Adapa, by Marduk to the meadows was taken, Abael, also known as Abel, he of the watered meadows, his name was thereafter called. How to build stalls Marduk taught him. For shepherding to start, the return of Dumuzi they awaited. When the Shah was completed, Dumuzi to earth returned. The essence seed of sheep growing with him he brought. Four-legged animals of Nibiru to another planet, the earth he conveyed. His return with essence seed was cause for much celebration. Into the care of his father Enki, Dumuzi with his precious cargo returned. The leaders then got together how to proceed with the new breed they considered. Never before was there a sheep on earth, a lamb has never to earth from the heavens been dropped, a she-goat has never before to her kid given birth on earth. Weaving of sheep's wool has never before been established on earth. The Anunnaki leaders, Enki and Enlil, Ninhasag and Ningish Zida, who the creators were, a creation chamber, a house of fashioning to establish was decided. Upon the pure mound of the landing place in the Cedar Mountains it was established. Near where the elixir seeds by Ninhasag brought were planted, there was the creation chamber established. There was the multiplying of the grains and of the agriculture on earth begun. Of Kain, also known as Cain, son of Adapa for sowing and reaping Ninurta, was his mentor. Of Abel, also known as Abel son of Adapa, the arts of sheep and lamb rearing and shepherding, Marduk was his mentor. When the first crops were reaped, when the first sheep matured, let there be a celebration. Enlil a decree proclaimed. Before the assembled Anunnaki, the first grains, the first lambs were presented. At the feet of Enlil, Enki and Cain by Ninurta guided, his offering placed. 
At the feet of Lord God Enlil and to Enki Abel by Marduk guided, his offering placed to the god in ritualistic fashion. Enlil to the brothers gave a joyful blessing, their labors he extolled. Enki embraced his son Marduk, the Eam for all to see he raised. Meat for eating, wool for wearing to earth have come, Enki said. Now this is the account of the generations of Adapa and the killing of Abael by Cain, also known as Abel and Cain, and what thereafter transpired. After the celebration of firsts was over, sullen was Cain's face. By the lack of Enki's blessing, greatly he was aggrieved. As to their tasks, the brothers returned. Abel before his brother was boasting, I am the one who abundance brings, who God satiates, who gives strength to the heroes, who wool for their clothing provides. Cain by his brother's words was offended. To his boasting strongly he objected, It is I who the plains luxuriates, who furrows with grains makes heavy in whose fields birds multiply, in whose canals fish become abundant, sustaining bread by me is produced with fish and fowl the gods' diet I variate. On and on the twin brothers each other disputed, through the winter time they argued. When summer began it was not raining, the meadows were dry, the pastures dwindled. Into the fields of his brother Abel, his flocks drove, from the furrows and the canals to drink water. By this Cain was angered. To move the flocks away, his brother he commanded. Farmer and shepherd, brother and brother, words of accusation uttered. They spat on each other, with their fists they fought. Greatly enraged, Cain a stone picked up, with it Abel in the head he struck. Again and again he hit him until Abel fell, his blood from him gushing. When Cain his brother's blood saw, Abel, Abel, my brother, he shouted. Motionless on the ground, did Abel remain. From him his soul had departed, by the brother whom he had killed Cain remained. For a long time he sat crying. Titi it was who of the killing was the first to know by a premonition. In a dream vision as she was sleeping, Abel's blood she saw. In the hand of Cain it was. Adapa from his sleep she awakened, her dream vision to him she told. A heavy sorrow fills my heart, did something terrifying happen? So did Titi to Adapa say, greatly agitated she was. In the morning the two from Eridu departed, to the whereabouts of Cain and Abel they went. In the field they found Cain, by the dead Abel he was still seated. A great cry of agony Titi shouted, Adapa spread mud on his head. What have you done? What have you done? To Cain they shouted. Silence was Cain's answer, to the ground he threw himself and wept. To Eridu city, Adapa returned, what had occurred to the Lord Enki, Adapa told. With fury, Enki confronted Cain, accursed you shall be, to him he said. From the Eden you must depart, among Anunnaki and civilized earthlings you shall not stay. As to Abel in the fields, his body cannot for the wild birds remain. As the Anunnaki custom is, he in a grave below a stone pile shall be buried. How able to bury Enki to Adapa and Titi showed, for the custom to them was not known. For thirty days and thirty nights was Abel by his parents mourned. To Eridu for judgment, Cain was brought, the exile sentence to pronounce Enki wished. For his deed, Cain himself must be slain. So did Marduk with anger say, Let the seven who judge be assembled. So did Ninurta of Cain the mentor say, Whoever of such an assembling ever heard, Marduk shouted, That for one not from Nibiru Anunnaki leaders shall to judge be called? Is it not enough that one by Ninurta mentored the one by me favored has killed? Is it not that as Ninurta Anzu did vanquish, so did Cain against his brother rise? Like the fate of Anzu Cain's fate should be, his life breath to be extinguished. So did Marduk in anger to Enki, Enlil and Ninurta say, Ninurta by the words of Marduk was saddened. Silence, not words, his answer was. Let me with Marduk my son words in private have, to them Enki said. When in Enki's private chambers he and Marduk were, my son, my son, to Marduk Enki softly spoke, your agony is great. Let us not agony with agony compound. A secret that is on my heart has heavily emboldened me to tell you. On a day of observation among the earthlings, as by the river I strolled, two earthling maidens my fancy caught. By them from my seed were Adapa and Titi conceived, a new kind of earthling, a civilized man by that upon the earth was brought. Whether they to procreate were Abel our king Anu in doubt was, by the birth of Cain and Abel were Anu and the council on Nibiru convinced. A new phase of Anunnaki presence on this planet was welcomed and approved. 
Now that Albul has been slain, and if Cain too shall be extinguished, satiation to an end would come, mutinies will be repeated, all that was achieved shall crumble. No wonder that to Abul a liking you took, the son of your half-brother Adapa he was. Now on the other one have pity, let the line of Adapa survive. So did Enki with sadness a secret to Marduk his son he revealed. By the revelation Marduk was at first astounded, then by laughter he was overcome. Of your love-making prowess much to me was rumored father, now of that convinced I am. Indeed let Cain's life be spared, to the ends of the earth let him be banished. So did Marduk, from anger to laughter changing, to his father say. In Eridu judgment upon Cain by Enki was pronounced, Eastward to a land of wandering for his evil deed Cain must depart, that his life must be spared, he and his generations shall be distinguished. By Ningish Zidda was the life essence of Cain altered. That his face a beard should not grow, Cain's life essence and genetic code Ningish Zidda changed. With his sister Awan as a spouse, Cain from the Eden departed, to the land of cold wanderings he set his course. Now the Anunnaki sat, and among themselves wondered, Without Abel, without Cain, who shall for us the grains grow and bread make? Who shall be the shepherd, the ewes multiply, wool for clothing provide? Let by Adapa and Titi more proliferation be, so did the Anunnaki say. With the blessing of Enki, Adapa his spouse Titi birthed again and again. One daughter, another daughter, each time again and again were born. In the 95th Shah, a new son Adapa and Titi finally had. Sati, he who life binds again, Titi named him. By him were the generations of Adapa counted. In all, thirty sons and thirty daughters Adapa and Titi had. Of them tillers of the land and shepherds for the Anunnaki gods toiled. By them did satiation to Anunnaki gods and civilized earthlings come back into fruition. In the 97th Shah, to Sati a son by his spouse Azura was born. By the name Enshi in the annals he was recorded. Master of humanity meant his name. By Adapa his father writing and numbers he was made to understand, and who the Anunnaki gods were. And all about Nibiru by Adapa Enshi was told. To Nibruki. By the sons of Enlil he was taken, secrets of the Anunnaki gods him they taught. How the perfumed oils for anointing Nana, Enlil's on earth the eldest, him showed. How the elixir from the Inbu fruits to prepare Ishkur, Enlil's youngest, him instructed. It was then that by this time the civilized man called the Anunnaki gods and worshipped them and exchanged offerings for blessings. Thereafter to Enshi by his sister Noam, a son was born. Kunin, he of the kilns, his name had the meaning. For by Niburta in Bad Tibira he was tutored, of furnace and kiln there he learned, how with bitumen's fires to make, how to smelt and refine he was taught. In the smelting and refining of gold for Nibiru, he and his offspring toiled. In the 98th Shah did this matter come about. Now this is the account of the generations of Adapa after Cain was exiled, and the heavenly journeys of Enkime and the death of Adapa. In the 99th Shah to Kunin, a son was born, by Mualit, a half-sister of Kunin, he was conceived. Malalu, he who plays, she named him. In music and song, he excelled. For him, Ninurta a stringed harp made, a flute for him he shaped. Hymns to Ninurta Malalu played, with his daughters before Ninurta they sang. The spouse of Malalu, the daughter of his father's brother was, Dana was her name. In the 100th Shah, since the count on earth had begun, a son to Malalu and Dunna was born, their firstborn he was. Irid, he of the sweet waters, his mother Dunna him named. It was him Dumuzi how wells to dig had taught, for flocks in distant meadows, water was to be provided. It was there, by the wells in the meadows, that shepherds and maidens gathered, where espousing and proliferation by civilized mankind exceedingly abounded. In his days, the Ajiji to earth were more frequently coming. To observe and watch from the heavens, they increasingly abandoned. To watch and see what on earth was transpiring, they increasingly desired. To be with them on Mars, Enki Marduk beseeched. To watch and see what on earth was transpiring, Marduk more fervently wished. At a well in the meadows did his spouse meet. Baraka was her name, the daughter of his mother's brother she was. 
At the conclusion of the 102nd Shah, a son to them was born, by the name Enkimi, by Enkimi understanding in the annals he was called. Wise and intelligent he was, numbers he quickly understood. About the heavens and all matters celestial, he was constantly curious. To him the Lord Enki took a liking, secrets once to Adapa revealed to him he told. Of the family of the sun and the twelve celestial gods Enki him was teaching, and how the months by the moon were counted and the years by the sun, and how by Nibiru the shahs were counted, and how the counts by Enki were combined, how the Lord Enki the circle of the heavens to twelve parts divided, a constellation to each one how Enki assigned, twelve stations in a grand circle he arranged with tablets of destiny, how to honor the twelve Anunnaki great leaders by names the stations were called. To explore the heavens, Enkime was eager, two celestial journeys he did make. And this is the account of Enkime's journeys to the heavens, and how the Ajiji troubles and intermarriages by Marduk were started. To be with Marduk in the landing place, Enkime was sent. From there, Marduk in a rocket ship to the moon did him take. There what Marduk from his father Enki had learned to Enkime he did teach. When to Earth Enkime returned, to be with Utu in Sipar, the place of the celestial chariots, he was sent. There, a tablet for writing what he was learning by Utu to Enkime was given. Utu in his bright abode, a prince of earthlings him installed. The rites him he taught, the functions of priesthood to begin. In Sipar with his spouse Edini, a half-sister, Enkime resided. To them in the 104th Shah a son was born, Matushal his mother him named, who by the bright waters raised the name meant. It was after that that Enkime on his second journey to the heavens went. This time too Marduk was his mentor and companion. In a celestial chariot heavenward they soared toward the sun and away from it they circled. To visit the Ajiji on Mars by Marduk he was taken, to him the Ajiji a liking was taken, of civilized earthlings from him they learned. Of him it is in the annals said, that to the heavens he departed, that in the heavens he stayed till the end of his days. Before Enkime for the heavens departed, all that in the heavens he was taught. In writings Enkime a record made, for his sons to know he wrote it. All that is in the heavens in the family of the sun he wrote down, and about the quarters of the earth and its lands and its rivers too. To the hands of Matushal, his firstborn son, the writings he entrusted, with his brothers Ragim and Gaidad, to study and abide by. In the 104th Shah was Matushal born. To the Ajiji troubles and what Marduk had done, he was a witness. By his spouse Ednat, a son to Matushal was born. Lumach, mighty man, was his name. In his days, conditions on earth became harsher. The toilers in field and meadow raised complaints. As a workmaster, the Anunnaki Lumak appointed, the quotas to enforce, the rations to be reduced. In his days, it was that Adapa his death time attained. And when Adapa knew that his days to an end were coming, let all my sons and sons of sons assemble themselves to me. He said that before I die, I may bless them and words to them speak before I die. And when Sati and the sons of the sons had gathered, where is Cain, my firstborn? Adapa of them all asked, let him be fetched to them all, he said. Before the Lord Enki Sati, his father's wish presented what to be done of the Lord, he asked. Enki then Ninurta summoned, let the banished one, of whom the mentor you were, to Adapa's deathbed be brought. In his bird of heaven, Ninurta betook himself to the land of wandering he flew. Over the lands he roamed, from the skies for Cain he searched. And when he him found, like on eagle's wings, Cain to Adapa he brought. When of his son's arrival, Adapa was informed, Let Cain and Sati before me come, Adapa said. Before their father the two came, Cain the firstborn on the right, Sati on the left. And the eyesight of Adapa having failed, for recognition his son's faces he touched. And the face of Cain on the right was beardless and the face of Sati on the left with beard was. And Adapa put his right hand on the head of Sati, the one on the left, and he blessed him and said, Of your seed shall the earth be filled, and of your seed as a tree with three branches, mankind a great calamity shall survive. And he put his left hand on the head of Cain on his right, and to him said, For your sin of your birthright you are deprived, but of your seed seven eastern nations shall come. In a realm set apart they shall thrive, distant lands they shall inhabit. 
but having your brother with a stone killed by a stone will be your end. And when Adapa finished these words saying, his hands dropped and he sighed and said, Now summon my spouse Titi and all the sons and all the daughters, and after my spirit leaves me, to my birthplace by the river and house of life carry me, and with my face toward the rising sun there bury me. Like a wounded beast Titi cried out, to her knees by Adapa's side she fell. And the two sons of Adapa Cain and Sati, in a cloth his body wrapped. In a cave by the banks of the river, by Titi shown, Adapa they buried. In the midst of the ninety-third Shah was he born, by the end of the one hundred and eighth he died. A long life for an earthling he had, the life cycle of Enki he did not have. And after Adapa was buried, Cain to his mother and brother farewell bade. Ninurta in his bird of heaven to the land of wandering him returned. And in a distant realm near the Asiatic peaks, Cain had sons and daughters. And he for them a city built, and as he was building, by a falling stone he was killed. In the Aden Lumak, as a workmaster, the Anunnaki served. In the days of Lumak, did Marduk and the Igigi intermarried with the children of men. Mankind proliferates. Adapa's line serves as royalty. Defying Enlil, Marduk espouses and marries an earthling female. Celestial disturbances and climate changes affect Mars. The LGGI decide to all descend to Earth, seize children of men's daughters as their wives. The promiscuous Enki begets a new human son named Zeusudra. Droughts and pestilences cause suffering on Earth. Enlil sees it as fated retribution and wants to return home. Ninhasag, who aged by Earth's cycles, also wants to return home. A mystery emissary that was sent by Creator of All warns them not to defy their destiny. Signs increase of a coming calamitous deluge. Most Anunnaki begin to depart back to Nibiru. Enlil enforces a plan to let mankind perish. Enki and Ninhasag start to preserve Earth's seeds of life. The remaining Anunnaki prepare for the day of the deluge and great flood. It will wipe out all of the rebellious Anunnaki and men. Nurgle, Lord of the Lower World, is to issue the warning. In the days of Lumak did Marduk and the Igigi with Earthlings intermarry. In those days on Earth the hardships were increasing. In those days on Lamu, also known as Mars with dryness and dust, was the planet enveloped. The Anunnaki who decree the fates, Enlil and Enki and Ninhasag, with each other consulted. What conditions on Earth and on Mars were altering, they wondered. On the sun flarings they observed, in the net forces of Earth and Mars there were disruptions. In the Abzu, at the tip the white land facing, instruments far observing they installed. In the charge of Nurgle, the son of Enki, and his daughter Ereshkigal, the instruments were put to the land beyond the seas, known as the Underworld. Ninurta was assigned, in the mountain land, a band of heaven-earth to establish. On Mars, the Igigi were restless. To pacify them, Marduk was the task given. Until what are the hardships causing, the way station on Mars must be kept. So, to Marduk, the leader said, the three who the fates decree with each other consulted. They looked at each other, how old the others are, each one of the others thought. Enki, who the death of Adapa was grieving, was the first one to speak. More than 100 shahs since my arrival have passed. To his brother and sister, he said, I was then a dashing leader. Now I am bearded, tired and old I am. An enthusiastic hero I was for command and adventure ready. Enlil then said, now I have children who have children, all on earth born. Old on earth we became, but those on earth born are even older sooner. So did Enlil to his brother and sister ruefully say. As for me, an old sheep they call me. So did Ninharsag wistfully say. While the others have been coming and going, turns on earth to serve taking. We the leaders have stayed and stayed. Perchance it is time to leave, so did Enlil say. Of that did I often wonder to them Enki was saying. Each time one of us three to revisit Nibiru wished, word from Nibiru always our corning there to prevent it. Of that I too did wonder, Enlil was saying, is it a thing on Nibiru, a thing on Earth? Perchance the life cycles that differ it concerns, so was Ninhasag saying. To watch and see what transpires, the three leaders decided. At that time fate, or was it destiny, in its hands the matters took. For it came to pass that soon thereafter Marduk to his father, Enki came, a matter of great gravity with his father, Enki, to discuss with Enki he wished. 
Upon the earth the three sons of Enlil spouses have chosen. A bride I wish to choose to have a spouse it is my desire. So did Marduk to his father Enki say, Your words happy make me. Enki to Marduk was saying, Your mother too shall rejoice. Is she one of the young ones who heal and succor give? Enki went on to ask, A descendant of Adapa she is, of earth, not Nibiru is she? Marduk softly whispered. With a puzzled look, Enki was speechless. Then uncontrolled words he shouted, A prince of Nibiru, a firstborn to succession entitled, An earthling will espouse, not an earthling but your own offspring. To him, Marduk said, A daughter of Enkime, who to heaven was taken she is, Sarpanit is her name. Enki, his spouse Ninki, summoned. To her, what with Marduk transpired, he related. To Ninki, his mother, Marduk, his heart's desire repeated and said, When Enki may with me was journeying, and of heaven and earth, him I was teaching. What my father once had said, I with my own eyes witnessed. Step by step on this planet, a primitive being, one like us to be, we have created, in our image and in our likeness, civilized earthling is, except for the long life. A daughter of Enkime, my fancy court, her to espouse I wish. Ninki, also known as Damkina, her son Marduk's words, she pondered. And the maiden, does she appreciate your gaze, my son? Indeed she does, Marduk to his mother said. This is not the matter to consider. Enki, with a raised voice, said, If our son this shall do, to Nibiru with his wife he would never go, his princely rights on Nibiru he forever will forsake. To this Marduk, with a bitter laughter, responded, My rights on Nibiru are non-existent. Even on earth my rights as firstborn have been trampled. This indeed is my decision. From prince a king on earth become the master of this planet. Let it so be, Ninki said. Let it so be, Enki also said. They summoned Matushal, the bride's brother, of Marduk's wish they him told. Humbled but with joy overwhelmed Matushal was. Let it so be, he said. When of the decision Enlil was told, with fury he was seized. It was one thing for the father with earthlings intercourse have, it is another matter for the son and earthling to espouse, lordship on her to bestow. When Ninhasag of the matter was told, greatly disappointed she was. Marduk any maiden of ours could espouse, even from my own daughters by Enki he could chose, half-sisters, as is the royal custom, he could espouse. So did Ninhasag say. With fury, Enlil to Anu on Nibiru of the matter, words beamed up. Too far has this behavior gone farther, it cannot be allowed. To Anu the king, Enlil said, on. Nibiru Anu the counselor summoned the matter with urgency to discuss. In the rule books of such a matter, no rule they found. Anu the savants also summoned the matter's consequences to discuss. On Nibiru Adapa, the maiden's progenitor could not stay, to Anu they were saying. Therefore to return to Nibiru with her, Marduk forever must be barred. Indeed, having to earth cycles become accustomed, even without her Marduk's return impossible might be. So were the savants to Anu saying, with that the counselors too agreed. Let the decision to earth be beamed. Anu was saying, Marduk marry can, but on Nibiru a prince he shall no more be. The decision by Enki and Marduk was accepted, Enlil too to the word from Nibiru bowed. Let there be a wedding celebration, in Eridu let it be, Ninki to them said. In the Edin Marduk and his bride cannot stay, Enlil the commander announced. Let us to Marduk and his bride a wedding gift make, a domain of their own, away from the Eden, in another land. So did Enki to Enlil say. Of Marduk being sent away, Enlil with consent to himself was thinking, to what land, of what domain are you speaking? Enlil to his brother Enki said, A domain above the Abzu, in the land that the upper sea reaches, one that by waters from the Eden is separated, that by ships can be reached. So did Enki to Enlil say. Let it so be, Enlil said. In Eridu a wedding celebration Ninki for Marduk and Sarpanit arranged. Her people by the sound of a copper drum the ceremony announced, with seven tambourines, her sisters the bride to her spouse presented. A great multitude of civilized earthlings in Eridu assembled, like a coronation to them the wedding was. Young Anunnaki also attended, Ijiji from Mars in great numbers came. To celebrate our leader's wedding, of Nibiru and Earth a union, to witness we came. So did the Ijiji their arrival in large numbers explain. Now this is the account of how the Ijiji and the daughters of the earthlings were abducted, and how afflictions followed and Zeusudra, who is also known as Noah, oddly was born. In a great number did the Ajiji from Mars to Earth come, 
only one-third of them on Mars stayed. To Earth came 200. To be with their leader, Marduk, his wedding celebration to attend, was their explanation. Unbeknownst to Enki and Enlil was their secret. To abduct and have conjugation was their plot. Unbeknownst to the leaders on Earth, a multitude of the Agigi on Mars got together. What a Marduk permitted is from us too, should not be deprived. To each other, they said, enough of suffering and loneliness, of not offspring ever having, was their oath. During their comings and goings between Mars and Earth, the daughters of the Earthlings, the Adipite females as them they called they saw, and after them they lusted. And to each other the plotters said, Come, let us choose wives from among the Adipite females, and children of our own will beget. One among them, Simjazi his name was, their leader became. Even if none of you agrees, I alone the deed shall do. To the others, he said, if a penalty for this sin shall be imposed, I alone for all of you shall it bear. One by one, others in the plot joined together. By an oath together to do it, they swore to do this together. By the time of Marduk's wedding, 200 of them on the landing place descended. Upon the great platform in the Cedar Mountains, they came down. From there to Eridu they journeyed, among the toiling earthlings they passed. Together with the earthling throng in Eridu they arrived. After the wedding ceremony of Marduk and Sarpanit had taken place, by a signal prearranged Shamgaz to the others a sign gave. An earthling maiden each one of the Elgijai seized, by force they them abducted. To the landing place in the Cedar Mountains, the Elgijai with the females went, into a stronghold the place they made, to the leaders a challenge they issued. Enough of deprivation and not having offspring. The Adapite daughters to marry we wish. Your blessing to this you must give, else by fire all on earth destroy we will. Alarm the leaders were, of Marduk, the Ljiji commander, charged to take they demanded. If in the matter I a solution must seek, with the Ajiji my heart in agreement is. So did Marduk to the others say, what I have done from them cannot be deprived. Enki and Ninharsag their heads shook, with begrudging agreement they voiced. Only Enlil was enraged without pacification. One evil deed by another has been followed. Fornication from Enki and Marduk, the Ajiji they have adopted. Our pride and sacred mission to the winds have been abandoned. By our own hands, this planet with earthling multitudes shall be overrun. With much disgust was Enlil speaking. Let the Ajiji and their females from Earth depart. On Mars, conditions unbearable have become. Surviving is not possible. So did Marduk to Enlil and Enki say. In the Eden they cannot remain, Enlil with anger shouted. With much disgust the gathering he left. In his heart, things against Marduk and his earthlings was Enlil plotting. Upon the landing platform in the Cedar Mountains were the Ajiji and their females secluded. Children there to them were born, children of the rocket ships they were called. Marduk and Sarpanit his spouse also had children, Asar and Satu were the first two sons called. To the domain above the Abzu, to him and Sarpanit granted, Marduk the Ijiji invited, to dwell in two cities that for his sons he had built. Some of the Ijiji and their offspring to the domain in the dark-hued land came. On the landing platform in the Cedar Mountains, Shamgaz and others did remain to the far east lands, lands of high mountains. Some of their offspring went. How Marduk of Earthlings his strength increases, Ninurta carefully observed. What are Enki and Marduk scheming? To his father, Enlil Ninurta said, The earth by the Earthlings inherited they will, Enlil to Ninurta said. Go, the offspring of Cain you must find, with them a domain of your own prepare. To the other side of Earth Ninurta went, the offspring of Cain he found. How tools to make and music to play he them taught. How in mining to engage and smelt and refine he showed them. How to build rafts of balsam trees he showed them. To cross a great sea he them guided. In a new land a domain they established. A city with twin towers there they built. A domain beyond the seas it was. The mountain land of the new bond heaven earth it was not. In the Eden, Lumak was the workmaster. Quotas to enforce was his duty. The earthlings rations to reduce was his task. His spouse was Batanash, the daughter of Lumak's father's brother she was. Of a beauty outstanding she was, by her beauty was Enki charmed. Enki to his son Marduk a word did send, to your domain Lumak do summon. How by earthlings a city to build there him teach. 
And when Lumak to the domain of Marduk was summoned, to the household of Ninharsag in Shurubak, the haven city, his spouse Batanash was brought, from the angry earthling masses protected and safe to be. Thereafter Enki, his sister, Ninharsag in Shurubak was quick to visit. On the roof of a dwelling when Batanash was bathing, Enki by her loins took hold. He kissed her, his seed into her womb he poured. With a child Batanash was, her belly was truly swelling. To Lumak from Shurabak word was sent, To the Eden return, a son you have. To the Eden, to Shurabak, Lumak returned. To him Batanash the son showed. White as the snow his skin was, the color of wool was his hair. Like the skies were his eyes, in a brilliance were his eyes shining. Amazed and frightened was Lumak. To his father Matushal he hurried. A son unlike an earthling to Batanash was born, by this birth greatly puzzled I am. Methuselah to Batanash came, the newborn boy he saw, by his likeness amazed he was. Is he one of the Ajiji gods offspring? Of Batanash Matushal the truth demanded. To Lumak your spouse whether this boy his son is, the truth reveal. None of the Ajiji is the boy's father, of this upon my life I swear. So did Batanash him answer. To his son Lamek Matushala then turned, a calming arm on his shoulders he put. A mystery the boy is, but in his oddness an omen to you is revealed. Unique he is, for a task unique by destiny he was chosen. What that task is I know not, in time appropriate known it shall become. So was Mathusala to his son Lamak saying. To what on earth was transpiring he was alluding, in those days the sufferings on earth were increasing. The days colder grew, the skies their rains were holding back, fields their crops diminished. In the sheepfolds you lambs were few. Let the sun to you born, unusual as he is, an omen be that a respite is coming. So did Matushala to his son Lumak say, let respite be his name. To Matushal and Lumak Batanash, her son's secret did not reveal. Ziusudra, he of long bright life days, she called him, in Shurubak he was raised. Ninhasag on the child, her protection and affection was bestowed. Of much understanding, he was endowed. With knowledge, he was by her provided. Enki, the child greatly adored, to read the writings of Adapa, him he taught. The priestly rites how to observe and perform the boy as a young man learned. In the 110th, Shah was Yusudra, also known as Noah, was born. In Shurubak, he grew up and espoused Emzara, and she bore him three sons. In his days, the sufferings on earth intensified. Plagues and starvations the earth afflicted. Now this is the account of earth's tribulations before the deluge, and how the mysterious Galzu decisions of life and death in secret guided. By the conjugations of Ajiji and the earthling daughters, was Enlil greatly disturbed. By Marduk's espousal of an earthling female, Enlil was much distraught. In his eyes, the Anunnaki mission to earth had become perverted. To him, the howling, shouting earthling masses, an anathema became. Oppressive, the pronouncements of the earthlings have become. The conjugations of sleep deprive me. So did Enlil to the other leaders say. In the days of Ziusudra, plagues and pestilences the earth afflicted. Aches, dizziness, chills, fevers the earthlings overwhelmed. Let us the earthlings curing teach how themselves to remedy to learn, so did Ninharsag say. This by decree I forbid, Enlil to her retorted, in the lands where to the earthlings have spread, waters from their sources did not rise, the earth shut its womb, vegetation did not sprout. Let us the earthlings pond and canal building teach, let them from the seas fish and sustenance obtain, so did Enki to the other leaders say. This by decree I forbid, Enlil to Enki said, let the earthlings by hunger and pestilence perish. For one shah, the earthlings ate the grasses of the fields. For the second shah and the third shah, the vengeance of Enlil they suffered. In Shurubak, Ziusudra's city, the suffering unbearable was becoming. To Eridu, Ziusudra, also known as Noah, of the earthlings a spokesman, journeyed. To the house of the Lord Enki he made his way, by the name of his lord he called. For help and salvation to him he pleaded. Enki by Enlil's decrees was bound. In those days the Anunnaki for their own surviving were concerned. Their own rations were diminished. By Earth's changes they themselves afflicted and aged quicker became. On Earth as on Mars, the seasons their regularity lost. For one Shah, for two Shahs, from Nibiru the heavenly circuits were studied. 
oddities in the planetary destinies from Nibiru were observed. On the sun's face, black spots were appearing. From its face, flames shot up. The planet Kishar, known as also, was misbehaving. Its host, its footings lost, dizzying were their circuits. The hammered bracelet known as the Asteroid Belt was by unseen net forces, pulled and pushed. For reasons unfathomed, the sun its family was upsetting. The destinies of the Celestials by unsavory fates were overtaken. On Nibiru, the savant's alarms raised. In the public squares, the people gathered. The creator of all, to primordial days, the heavens is returning. Angry is the creator of all, voices from amongst the people shouted. On Earth, the tribulations were increasing. Fear and famine their heads reared. For three shahs, for four shahs, the instruments the white land facing were observed. By Nurgle and Ereshkigal, odd rumblings in the white land snows were recorded. The snow ice that the white land covers is sliding. So did they from Abzu's tip report. In the land beyond the seas, Ninurta in his haven foretelling instruments established. Quakes and jitters at the Earth's bottom with the instruments he noticed. An odd matter is afoot. So did Enlil to Anu on Nibiru words of alarm send. For the fifth Shah, for the sixth Shah, the phenomena gained strength. On Nibiru, the savants an alarm raised. Of calamities to the king they forewarnings gave. The next time Nibiru, the sun shall be nearing. Earth to Nibiru's net force exposed shall be. Mars in its circuits on the sun's other side shall a station take. From the net force of Nibiru, Earth in the heavens protection shall not have. Kisha and its host agitated shall be. Mars shall also shake and wobble. In Earth's great below, the snow ice of the white land its footing is losing. The next time Nibiru, the closest to Earth, shall approach, the snow ice off the white land's surface shall come a-sliding. A watery calamity it shall cause. By a huge wave, a deluge, the Earth will be overwhelmed. On Nibiru great was the consternation, uncertain about Nibiru's own fate. King, savants and counselors about Earth and Mars also greatly worried. The king and the counselors a decision made. For evacuating Earth and Mars, the Anunnaki must prepare. In the Abzu, the gold mines shut down. There from the Anunnaki to the Eden came. In Bad Tibera, smelting and refining ceased. All gold to Nibiru was lofted. Empty, for evacuating ready, a fleet of fast celestial chariots to Earth returned. On Nibiru, the heavenly signs were watched. On Earth, the tremors recorded were. It was at that time that from one of the celestial chariots, a white-haired Anunnaki stepped off. Galzu, Great Noah, was his name. With steps majestic to Enlil his way he made, to him a sealed message from Anu he presented. I am Galzu, emissary plenipotentiary of king and council, to Enlil he said. By his coming Enlil was surprised, no word from Anu of that did forecome. Enlil the seal of Anu examined, unbroken and authentic it was. In Nibruki the message tablet was read, its encoding was trustworthy. For King and Council Galzu speaks, his words are my command. So did the message from Anu state, that Enki and Ninharsag be also summoned was Galzu's request. When they came to Ninharsag, Galzu pleasantly smiled. Of the same school and age we are, to her he said. This Ninharsag could not recall, the emissary was as young as a son, she was as his olden mother. Simple is the explanation. Galzu to her said, by our winter's slumbered life cycles it is caused. Indeed, this matter is of my mission apart. About the evacuation, it is a secret. Ever since Dumuzi on Nibiru had stayed, returning Anunnaki on Nibiru examined were. Those who on Earth the longest stayed by the returning harshly were afflicted. Their bodies to Nibiru cycles were accustomed no longer. Their sleep was disturbed. Their eyesight was failing. The net force of Nibiru waited their walk. Their minds were also affected, as sons were older than the parents they had left. Death, my comrades, to the returnees quickly came. Of that, I am here a warning to give. The three leaders, on earth the longest, by the words silent became. Ninhasag was the first to speak. That much was to be expected, she was saying. Enki, the wise one, to her words consented. That much was clear, he said. Enlil, with anger, was seized. Before, the earthlings like us were becoming. Now we as earthlings have become to this planet imprisoned. 
This whole mission to a nightmare turned by Enki and his earthlings from masters to slaves we were made. To the outburst, Galzu with compassion listened. Indeed, much there is to ponder, he said. On Nibiru, much thinking and soul-searching deep questions are raising. Should Nibiru to its fate been left, whatever by the creator of all intended, to be let to happen, or was the coming to earth by the creator of all conceived? And we only unwitting emissaries. Of that, my comrades, the debate will continue. So was Galzu to them saying. Now this is the secret command from Nibiru. The three of you on earth will remain. Only to die to Nibiru you will return. In celestial chariots, the earth encircling, the calamity you shall outweigh. To each of the other Anunnaki, a choice to leave or the calamity outweigh must be given. The Ajiji who earthlings espoused must between departure and spouses choose. No earthling, Marduk Sarpanit included, to Nibiru to journey is allowed. For all who stay and what happens see, in celestial chariots they safety must seek. As for all the others, to depart for Nibiru forthwith they ready must be. So did Galzu Nibiru's commands to the leaders in secret reveal. Now this is the account of how the Anunnaki to abandon Earth decided, and how an oath they took mankind to let in the deluge perish. In Nibruki, Enlila council of Anunnaki and Agiji commanders summoned. The leaders' sons and their children also were present. Word of the impending calamity, Enlil to them a secret revealed. To a bitter end, Earth's mission has come, said Enlil. All who wish to leave must will leave in celestial boats to Nibiru will be evacuated. But if earthling spouses they have, without the spouses they must leave. Igigi, who to their spouses and offspring attached are, let them to the highest peaks on earth escape. As for a few of us Anunnaki who will choose to stay, in boats of heaven in earth's skies will we remain, the calamity to outweigh, the fate of earth to witness. As the commander, I shall be the first one to stay. So was Enlil saying, by their own choice will be the others. With my father I choose to stay, the calamity to face. So did Ninurta announce, to the lands beyond the oceans after the deluge, I will return. Nana, Enlil's on earth firstborn, an odd wish announced, the deluge to outweigh not in earth's skies but on the moon, that was his wish. Enki, an eyebrow raised, Enlil though puzzled approved. Ishkur, Enlil's youngest, to remain on earth with his father his decision made. Utu and Inanna, Nana's children who on earth were born to stay they declared. Enki and Damkina known as Ninki, to stay and earth not abandoned chose. Proudly they so announced, the Igigi and Sarpanit I shall not desert, Marduk with anger stated. One by one Enki's other sons their choice to stay announced, Nurgle and Gibel, Ninagal and Ningish Zida and Dumuzi too. All eyes to Ninhasag then turned. With pride her choice to stay, she declared, My life work is here. The earthlings I helped engineer and create, I shall not abandon. By her words, Anunnaki and Igigi to a clamor were stirred. About the earthlings' fate they inquired. Let the earthlings for the abominations perish, so did Enlil proclaim. A wondrous being by us was created, by us saved it must be, Enki to Enlil shouted. To this Enlil with his own shouted words retorted, from the very beginning at every turn, the decisions by you modified were. To primitive workers procreating you gave, to them knowledge of good and evil you endowed, the powers of the creator of all into your hands you have taken. With fornication Adapa you conceived, understanding to his line you gave, his offspring to the heavens you have taken, our wisdom with them you shared. Every rule you have broken, decisions and command you ignored, because of you, by a civilized earthling brother, a brother was murdered. Because of Marduk, your son the Ajiji, like him with earthlings, intermarried. Who is lordly from Nibiru, to whom the earth alone belongs, to no one is no longer known. Enough, enough to all that I say, the abominations cannot continue. Now that a calamity by a destiny unknown has been ordained, let what must happen, happen. So did Enlil angrily proclaim that all leaders solemnly swear to let events unhindered occur, of all Enlil demanded. First to take the oath of silence was Ninurta, others of Enlil's side followed. Nurgle of Enki's sons was first to take the oath, others of Enki's sons followed. To your command I bow, Marduk to Enlil said, but of what worth is the swearing? If Igigi their spouses will abandon, would not the fear among the earthlings spread? Ninhasag was in tears, the words of the oath she faintly whispered. 
Enlil at his brother Enki gazed. It is the wish of king and council, to him he said. Why will you bind me with an oath? Enki to his brother Enlil asked. The decision by you was made. On earth it is a commandment. The floodwaters I cannot arrest. The earthling multitudes I cannot save. To what oath to bind me you therefore desire? So did Enki his brother ask. To let it all happen as if by fate decreed, let it as Enlil's decision be known. On Enlil alone let the responsibility forever rest. So did Enki to all pronounce. Then Enki from the assembly departed disappointed. Marduk with him also left. With quick words of command, Enlil the assembly to order brought tasks for what was to be done, he with firm decisions assigned. Between those who will depart and those who will stay the grouping arrange. Places for assembly to designate, equipment to collect, chariots to assign. First to depart were those who to Nibiru were returning. With much embracing and the locking of arms, in joy mixed with sorrow, the celestial boats they boarded. One after the other, the vehicles from Sipar roared aloft. At first those left behind journey safely. I shouted, then muted were the cries. After the launchings toward Nibiru completed were, the turn of Marduk and the Ajiji with earthling spouses came. Marduk them all on the landing place assembled, a choice to them he gave. With him and Sarpanit and two sons and the daughters to Lahmugo, there the calamity outweighed, or to distant mountain lands on earth disperse, a haven from the deluge to find. Enlil then of those who remained, took account, by groupings to them chariots he assigned. Ninurta to the mountain lands beyond the oceans, Enlil directed on Earth's rumblings to report. While the others sat idly waiting, Enki and Ninharsag a challenging task undertook. Ninharsag in Shurabak by some of her female assistants was helped. Enki by Ningish Zida in the Abzu at the Olden House of Life was assisted. Male and female essences and life eggs they collected, of each kind two by two, two by two, they in Shurabak and the Abzu preserved for safekeeping while in earth circuit to be taken, thereafter the living kinds to recombine. At that time word from Ninurta came, Earth's rumblings ominous are. At that time word from Nurgle and Ereshkigal came, she said, the white land is shaken. In Sipar, all the Anunnaki gathered, the day of the great flood has arrived. End of Tablet 6 through 9. Stay tuned for Episode 3 of Sitchin's Lost Book of Enki Tablet 10 through 14. If you like this episode, please like, share and subscribe to our channel for more episodes on ancient myths and legends only at Astral Legends. May the eternal light forever guide your paths.